ever. So hello and welcome to uh, Intermediate Art. My name is Simon Wallace Miller. I am a, where am I? I'm a senior analytical manager working in NHS England. I work in the Southwest Performance and Analytics team and also work in the central um, uh, elective recovery insight cell. So uh, across different teams. Um, my background is I've probably been working, uh, using R now for about, my goodness me, it's about five or six years. Um, I came from a, a very, I mean, it's crazy going sort of my, my sort of journey, my journey getting back to my council days when I used to look, work for a local council, I used to work with child protection data. Our entire database carry, covered about uh, 8,000 children in total. So we would do absolutely everything in Excel using business objects. We would like download, uh, if we wanted to, we would download all the assessments, et cetera. And if we wanted to add in like the children's ethnicity to that data set, we would just download the entire database of 8,000 children and do a V lookup to add in all of their personal details. So everything, everything was done on this site. Like, massive v lookup process of of uh, of excel and we would report uh, once a quarter was what was our reporting cycle and we would report a quarter in a years uh, in arrears because that's how long it would take us to do these crazy manual processes uh, which I guess is, you know, what's driven me to sort of like automate and uh, and also those crazy processes were just so prone to error with copy and pasting and they're just just hideous. So I guess that's part of my background of why I've really embraced embraced automation and rap and all of those really really good things uh, where we are now. Um, so I moved on from there. I I joined the police. I I got my first. Uh, site of like click view and some business intelligence uh and the first bit of code which was was amazing i was like i'm like yeah and, and then i think i was there for about six months and then i moved into my first little mental health trust where i actually got my hands dirty with some sequel for the first time and just kind of thought back of like i could write a sequel script which would automate all of that stuff that I used to do in my trust and uh, I could probably, uh, you know, write a script that would do, you know, in an afternoon, what would probably have taken me a month to produce. So uh, really got keen into that. Um, so I think from there, we kind of got involved in the sort of the planning round. I was in a mental health trust. Our, our traditional planning method was add 5% to our previous and just use that as our forecast. However, I wanted to use some sort of more advanced forecasting techniques. So again, started to look into R. Uh, the other big driver was we were, I, was, I, I became sort of responsible for our integrated performance report and we wanted to start using sort of SVC. At the time, um, we only had some really, really sort of shonky uh, uh, Excel template thing to produce SPC. So we wanted to be able to do that at uh yeah a sort of high level which is sort of like 150 odd charts at once we again we didn't want to do that in a manual way so really started to embrace our um and, and and get into that i was also really fortunate to get into the sort of hsma program and um which is the health serving modelist associates program which is all around uh putting some data science and operational research into um in, into trusts and into the nhs and then from there went on and, and did a master's in in healthcare data science where I did a lot of R and Python and actually started to learn a lot more about robust statistics and proper statistics rather than uh, a lot of the performance stuff we put in there. So as I say, so I'm part sort of, I mean, I've definitely come from a performance background. I guess I've kind of moved from performance. I kind of straddle a bit of performance and a bit of data science at the moment. Um, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about R is that it allows you to do all of those things. Um, so once, you know, even if you do go down that, I just want to create a really nice automated report with some really strong visuals and some, you know, automated commentary and some quality tables. It's all there in R. So I guess that's, you know, where I would, would really, really push R. So that's kind of me and my R journey and possibly my R credentials. Um so hello, I'm not going to ask everybody for a massive plot of history or anything, but I will introduce very quickly uh, Lynn, who is my co-host, 
she's here very much today to be your voice if you uh are not got a voice so please do put things in chat as we go along if you get stuck she's there to sort of pick that up there and she's also there as a sort of critical friend and um i don't know just a, a general voice and possibly other sounding board if i, I start scratching my head so um lynn do you want to say hello <laughs> um, I'm Lynn Howard. Um, I'm a data projects manager within the digital enablement portfolio office. Uh, I've been using R for about five years and uh, SQL for a lot longer than that. I, I taught myself SQL back in 2001 whilst I was on maternity leave. Um, I, I um, was frustrated that uh, a baby carrier that I wasn't wanted to buy wasn't available in the UK. So I built an e-commerce website um, with a SQL backend and um, set up a business to import uh, baby carriers uh, because that's the sort of thing that you do when you have a very small child. And, uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, totally insane, but it was good fun. Um, yeah, it's, it's well known that having small children means you've got loads of time on your hands. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and I'm sort of at, at the opposite end of the R spectrum from Simon in that I spend uh, the majority of my time uh, automating processes. Um, so um, trying to eliminate the cut and paste in producing uh, reports in PDFs and PowerPoints, etc., uh, to stop people manually going into uh, various databases and cut and pasting individual fields into a PowerPoint slide. Fabulous. So hopefully b between us, we sort of got most things sort of covered in to some extent. As I said, this is sort of intermediate R, so we are expecting a sort of a basic knowledge. Um, would assume hopefully you've at least done um, the sort of introduction course and have got your head around that. Um, and then this is designed as a bit of a follow on or just uh, you know, people who've done the intermediate stuff have done a few bits and pieces and shows you some sort of further ticks and trips that we're going to uh, go on from there. Um, probably should have said this first while I was blabbling away, but if you could just pop into the chat, um, just a hello, uh, who you are and, and, and where you work. Generally, uh, just pop in there also, you know, is there anything specific you would like from the course? If there's any yeah, absolutely specific use cases. We can have a think about that maybe towards the end if there's nothing uh, we haven't covered. Um, and generally what your experience in, in R is. And hopefully hopefully nobody's going to say none whatsoever, because if so, that's going to be very, very challenging. Um, so while you're doing that, I'll also just talk about how we're going to run things through today. So everybody hopefully has got access to uh, Posit Cloud. If I just uh, pop that into the chat, the link. Uh, oh, no, that's not right. We need to go back one, don't we? Uh, where are we? So copy link. Where's the chat gone? There's the chat. Oh, my goodness me. What's that? That's not right. Um, oh, it's giving me the web address. That's not very useful. Is that better? No, it's just posit.cloud, I think, is the actual web address, uh, if I remember correctly. No, rstudio.cloud, is that right? No, it's posit.cloud. Yeah, right. Uh, so, yeah, if you could get on to... Is, it? is that the web address? Yes. Yeah, if you could log into posit.cloud. Um, if you haven't used it before, it will, there's no sign up required. You can just input with a, a, your new normal Google account. Um, and hopefully you can get onto posit.cloud. Do you stick your hands up if you can't get onto Posit Cloud? Um, everybody at any point, please, 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 I'm just going to wibble on today. There are lots of people on here. Do feel free that you can just shout at me and tell me to stop if I'm, I'm blurbling away and, and not making any sense. Uh, likewise, put anything into the chat, and uh, hopefully Lynn or I will will pick that up. 
uh, and we can go through. I don't want anybody to be massively left behind. So please don't feel that if I'm going too fast, because I'm going to go pretty fast. If there's anything you really don't understand and you just want a bit of clarity around, you know, do shout out. Otherwise, it's just going to, you know, there's no point for this just being a recording of me talking at you. The whole point is, is just trying to make it a little bit interactive. So if you do have any questions, do stop me at the time and um, and, and let's let's do that. So if you've got into Posit Cloud, you should let me, uh, let me find if I can uh, work out how to do this. Screen share. Uh, where are we? Screen share. Screen share. Um, I want to share that one. And then share. Um, if anybody does have to do screen sharing, um, which hopefully we will do, um, people will make mistakes. I will ask you to screen share so we can just sometimes have a look at your code. Um, I mean, please make mistakes. You know, the, the classic, uh, everybody learns from mistakes. So if, you, if, so if you make a mistake, then you are really, really, really uh, creating a learning opportunity for everybody. So, you know, please make mistakes. And uh, that would be that would be awesome. Um, so you probably won't have a massive uh, splurge of stuff you might yours might be empty you might have some um introductory training oh let me move the chat out of the way um but hopefully you have got a, a your workspace and if you go into content there should be an option here for new project has everybody got that and what we want to do is new project from git repository and we click on that. And here is one I have prepared earlier. So let me just copy the link of that into the chat. Where do I just put the chat? Um, where is that going? Oh, sorry. Uh, where's the chat gone? Chat. Um, that's the repository name. But, oh, there it is. Sorry. Excellent. So if you copy uh, that uh, link, which I've just put into the chat, into the URL of your Git repository, which is github.com, Simon slash WM uh, intermediate R training. As you can see, I've got one I prepared earlier. It might throw a wobble for me because I've done it before and I've already got it full. But anyway, that's what we want to do. So that was new project. There was an option for new project from Git repository. We want an RStudio project and we want to use that URL, which I've just pointed in there. And OK. And that should create a project for you. Anybody got any problems with that? Is it doing what it should be doing? And eventually, it should come up with uh, an R Studio page. I don't know if mine has been exceptionally slow or everybody's is this slow. Fantastic. All good. Doesn't look like a proper URL when I copy it. Work for me, work for me. Uh, Anita, is it working? Yeah, I had to right click it. Fabulous. Oh, man. Another X click view user. I did like, unfortunately, when we, I, I probably shouldn't go into this too much, but when we had ClickView, we had a really, we, we, they obviously spent loads of money on the ClickView, but didn't spend a lot of money on the server. So um, 
we we were running it on the most shonky machines ever. It was really painful. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll talk about click view later. So right, so hopefully you should have intermediate R training come up. Um, oh, have we got some? Is that an issue? Oh, sorry, that's just somebody. Hi, I'm Georgie. Let's move. What's that thing? Not that. Cool. Okay. Um, so you should have uh, uh, obviously an empty R thing. Your environment should be empty, but you should have a bunch of files that you should have available. And the one that we want to use is intertrain inter student version. So for intermediate training, the student version. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff there. There is also an intermediate train non-student version, which is a version which I've made, which has got answers in it. Um, all the code that we're going to be running through today is in this one file. All the data sets we're going to use are going to be here. I'm just going to go to Tools, Global Environments, uh, Appearance, and I'm just going to make my screen uh, my text a little bit bigger because I know sometimes on the Zoom thing it's a little bit difficult to see. Um, it is telling me that I've got some packages which I'm uh, calling which I haven't installed. Not going to install those now. Let's install them as we go along. So uh, just click on the don't show again, again to get rid of this. Um, and then hopefully, I'd say if you just click on the inter train student version, you should get the code off and running. Um, as I said, please, please, please do shout at, at any point. We don't uh, if you're you're not there. So uh, just a quick reminder of, of the help functions. At any point, we're going to do a whole bunch of functions. Um, you can just hover over a function. So you can, uh, let's just, I don't know, let's find a function. And you can press F1 on it. It's not going to work on that one, is it? Because it's still on head. There we go. Uh, you can press F1 on it, and it will bring up the, um, the, the, the the help file. You can go into the console, and we can do question mark head. Or obviously, you can also go into the help file here and do a search for it. So there's lots of different ways of, of getting the help file. And we will be using this in order to um, just, with some basic functions, trying to work out how do we can add some extra bits in there. So make sure you know how to call up this, this help menu because we will be using that. Um, obviously, you can search within the help tab and obviously Google. Google is our friend for, for everything. So uh, what we're going to do is basically a whole bunch of um, intermediate training. We're going to do quite a lot of wrangling. I think the majority, probably 80% of the course is just going to be wrangle, around wrangling. We're going to do about 10% is going to be, we're just going to do some sort of SPC charts and some very basic sort of like charting stuff with a little bit around factors and charting. And just going to show you the very introductory stuff around functional programming and how to create your own functions. And just going to show very, very simply how to do loops. But as I said, the majority of the, the, the course content is just going to be around data wrangling. Um, Going to start with uh, a nice little uh, a little, little package here, or not a little package, little command here, which is um, checking to see whether um, a, a library is installed. And if it's not installed, install it. And then no matter what, um, then just call that library. And that's using this if require. So if we don't require the um, the NHSR data sets. So that's basically saying if it's not installed, install it. And then the next thing to do is call that library. So if it is installed, it's not going to install it. It's just going to call the library. Um, but anyway, so let's just run those. And it should hopefully check because we haven't used this, this environment before. It's going to run through and it's going to see, oh, we haven't got these, uh, we haven't got Tidyverse installed. We haven't got LHSR data sets installed. So it should be now installing those for you in your environment. And also once it's finished installing them, it will call the libraries. And I've forgotten how long Tidyverse takes to install because it's really big, isn't it? Uh, so I will blabber on for two seconds while I do that. So hopefully that's all going through and nobody's got any problems there. Um, and it just shows you just how much is in the tidyverse. 
We are going to be using the NHSR data sets package, which is basically um, a, base, a, a set of dummy data which has been put up. It's very specific healthcare data. Somebody's just uploaded it onto the um, onto GitHub, and it just means that we're all going to be using the same data set. And obviously, whatever we're doing is is all going to be reproducible. Um, it's a We'll have a look at it in a minute um, when this is all. My goodness me. Sorry, uh, Simon, to interrupt. Really no sorry. Uh, could you just quickly talk me through um, how to get set up? Because I've just copied ah. the link. Um, it's because I've only just got into Posit Cloud. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. So if you go into Posit Cloud, top yeah. right hand side, it says new project. Oh, yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, and then the one that says create new project from Git repository at the bottom. Yeah. And then if you click, if you copy the um, uh, the link that I put into the chat, the GitHub link, um, let me pop it in the chat again because probably people... Yeah, chat. it's working. And then hopefully that should then chug through and it will get you to here. Then once you're in there, if you click on this inter intertrain student version, that will bring up yeah. the script and then That's you can just easy. run these. And then you can wait for that tiny verse to run. Uh, Thank so, you so much. No problem. No problem. So hopefully you hey, can Simon, see... Sorry. Sorry yep. to jump in. No um, this is probably a really, really stupid question, but uh, are we all right to make us own notes on this? It's not going to break anything for anyone else. No, 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 no. No, no. Happy. You know, by all means, write loads of comments all over this stuff whatsoever. So by pulling the stuff from the repository, I've, I've made a copy of it available and the copy uh, of the repository. All you've done is just copied that into the cloud. You're not, it doesn't feed back to the repository. So I'm not going to go into sort of the, the ins and outs of GitHub at the moment, but all you are doing is using a copy of it. So it's yours to break and do whatever you want with it. At the end of the session, I'll show you, obviously all the stuff we're, we're going to be doing now is going to be on the cloud. What you might want to do is go, that's great, but I want my own version of it that I can run on my own computer. So we'll have to download it from the cloud and then you'll have your own version and it will just be a complete standalone version. You can do anything you want with. That's perfect. Thank you. No worries. Hi, no. Can, I, can I also come in? I have both of the same issue. So can you talk me through it as well? I don't manage to open. So project. you've got Posit, Posit Cloud up on the top right hand side that says new project. There's an option at the bottom that says create new project from GitHub repository. And then you want to copy. I can't see it because it's gone. Oh no, where's it gone? Uh, and then you want to copy that URL. Uh, let me just copy that URL again into the chat. New project. Yeah, new project. Create new repository from uh, GitHub. I think it's the bottom object. Yeah, from Git repository, it says. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then and I then put the link in. In the chat, copy that link. Yeah, it didn't work. It didn't work? What's it doing? Uh, it says, cannot access Git repository. It's a red. Warning. Um, oh, okay. yeah, because I've done your inter your beginner course last week. Of the okay, it was fine. Can so you just any... click on the link? Does it does it just open as a link? Uh, let me copy the link again. Sorry, everyone about this. No, 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 no. I need to set it up. I know some. Okay. Oh, environment error. Now it's something else. Environment error. Could you share your screen just so we can see if there's any? So if you click on the link, does it come up with the GitHub link? I'm waiting for it to stand up. Yes, it does. I can see that. So, you, so um, this opens. OK, I'll share my screen. Yeah. So that, that. Um, how do I? Can you see my screen? Not yet. Uh, I might. Oh, yeah. So you've got that. Okay. So that yeah. is up. So go back to your posit. The, 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 uh -huh. No. What is that going on? Lost it. Uh, uh, mm. Where's your posit cloud gone? Yeah. Gone. I'll type it again. Yeah. Okay, 
Okay, so I went to new project, new project from Git repository, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I paste this here and I get this. So if you go to the top right hand side and your top thing where you've actually got the GitHub open, your next tab, mm -hmm. and copy the URL from that. From here, okay. Yeah, copy it from there. And pasted it here, yeah? Because that seems to be doing something weird, doesn't it? Yeah, and paste that. Yeah. That should do it. There we go. Yeah. That's All the... right. All right. Thank you so much. For some um, reason, it seemed to copy the metadata rather than the actual link or something. Uh, anyway. Okay. So, yeah, you'll be on catch up for a minute. Let Thank me... you. No Thank problem. You. All good. Uh, let's not leave anybody behind. So, yeah, please do shout. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Oh, back on that one. Um, hi, Simon. I still hi. haven't managed. I haven't managed to link the GitHub to the project. I can't actually see where to create a new project from. Okay. Um, Can you show your screen then? Let's have a yeah. look. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the share screen thing, just so you know, on Zoom, you have to click on the screen and then click on the bottom left hand, bottom right hand bit where it says share screen. Froze me every time because I'm so used to Teams, you just click on the screen. Okay. Um, ah. So it's not sharing now. Okay. So you want to go? Where have you gone? So yeah, you've gone too far forward. So go back. Click on the top left hand side where it says your workspace. And on the top, have you got a one that I can't see because I think I've got me in the way? Uh, yeah, new project, new project okay. repository. Okay. And then type in the URL there. And hopefully that will be, yep, so copy that one. And then OK. Bingo. We all good? Thanks. No worries. No worries. Uh, where are we? We are that one. If I stop sharing, I can't, yeah, I can't work right, out stop me sharing. Trying, it's me trying to work out how to take it back again. So uh, once you've gone through, uh, once you've got it up and running, uh, click on this intertrain student version and then get down to this bit. Um, so the first time I've run it, obviously I didn't have those packages installed, so it's installed them. Now if I run it again, um, it just checks through, sees that they're installed, so it doesn't install them and it just calls the libraries. So that's a really nice way if you're going to sort of be sharing a piece of code with somebody else and you're using a library which you're not sure whether they've got installed or not, uh, especially if it's somebody who's relatively new to R and doesn't know about installing libraries, just to give them a bit of code where it will work whether they, you know, if, if they run it and if, if they're running it for the first time and haven't got that library installed, then it will, it will install it. So, uh, I would imagine that our tidyverse people, or the people who are a little bit low, <laughs> are not so late on that bit, are probably still installing the tidyverse. But, um, so, Simon, just a yes. quick question. Yeah. Do you have a different, do you have a different way of, um, for example, maybe someone's QA in your code. Um, can you require them all the packages that you've used in the code at the top? Because um, obviously you're listing each package individually here. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there is a way you can do the whole lot in one really nice, easy way. Remind me in the chat and I'll show you some code where you basically can list out, you need this, 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 and this, and it will do a check against all of them, install the ones that you need, and then, and then, um, uh, install those and use those there's also a, a much much more advanced version that you can do where you basically create an r environment and basically share the environment with somebody so the whole environment is these are the packages these are the exact versions of the packages that i've used and then you can share that because sometimes and it's it's rare but it does happen that you know somebody might update a package and they might tweak what a function has done or does um so you can be very specific about this bit of code works with these very specific libraries at these very specific versions of those libraries. And you can share that. Not going to go into there. That's much more advanced and probably when you're doing much, much more advanced things. But um, so we have pulled the NHSR data sets, which has a bunch of um, basic data sets in there. 
And today we are going to be using our friend, the AE attendances. This is going to be our friend to the day of for the day. By the end of the by end of the session, you're going to be sick to death of this, this uh, stuff because we're going to uh, be doing so much on this. So we've got our um, our data attendances. Um, it's a really simple data set. Um, so we can have a quick look at a, a few things. So we can just have a look here. We can see it's got um, it's got a period in it, which is uh, in, in a date format. It's got an organization code, which is a, a factor, which is a code. It's got a type, which is one, two, or other. And it's got the numbers of attendances, numbers of breaches, and numbers of admissions. And if we just do the classic look at our data set, there we have it. It's uh, very, <laughs> looks very, very dull. Um, it doesn't do anything particularly exciting, but it is a, it is a time series data set. So that's going to be quite useful for what we've got. We've got a whole different bunch of organization um, uh, organization codes for it. So for this period, we've got an organization code. We've got a type one, two, or other. And then we've got the numbers of attendances, breaches, and admissions. Um, as I said, it looks like a really simple data set, but we're going to be doing some crazy bonkers stuff with, with this. But um, yeah. Let's just have a look at that and just make sure that you're kind of happy with with what's in there. Um, obviously, I assume that you know you can sort of click on the the, the top bit here, which allows you to to sort things. We can uh, look at our attendances, our breaches, and our admissions. Uh, we can also pop it out into a new window if we want. And we can see our window here, which is quite useful when you're working across multiple screens that you can sort of pop your data set out into a different screen. And, uh, you know, you can still be writing code, but looking over and seeing what's in your in your data set. So uh, that's our data set. Um, you can do also some sort of obviously some basic filters on this as well. Uh, we can do RY5 and so that's quite interesting. We can see that our RY5 here is has got a type series, but it's only got type others. So for whatever reason, they don't have ones and twos. So there are going to be bits and pieces missing within our data set. So hopefully that's me belabeled along enough for the uh, people to get their uh, uh, tidyverse installed. And has everybody got data or some data which we are going to be playing with? um shall if not so just going to do some basic r functions some really nice just really really simple uh things that you might see so um get a list of column names uh really really i always forget what columns are called um so you can do col names data and it will bring back the names of the columns Sometimes when you've got something, uh, you know, you've got a really, really big data set and it's got some really horrible convoluted name, it's really nice that you can sort of just double click and then copy control C or whatever. And then if I wanted to, I can, you know, I can paste that into my code because I, you'll see when I'm writing code for, for real, my, my, my hands are really, really fudgy. So, um, <laughs> my, 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 uh, it, it's really good to be uh, really explicit. Oh, sorry, I should have done some housekeeping. Uh, let me just get into very, very quick housekeeping before we get there. Um, has, if anybody's got any specific time that they need to do lunch or anything like that, they've got to go and walk the dog or uh, whatever, please put that in the chat. Um, I will make sure that we obviously take regular breaks as as, as we go through. We'll sort of have 10 minute coffee breaks here and there. I'm a bit of a coffee addict, so we'll make sure we do that. If anybody's got any specific time that they want for, co uh, for, for, um, for lunch, pop it in the chat otherwise it will be at some point between about 12 and, and 2 and, and we'll do that and obviously happy to sort of discuss with the you lot how, how long you wait want to want for lunch aiming to finish at 4 30 although I do blurble around all over the place there is going to be a lot to cover today it's it, it's not of course I've run as many times as in, uh, introductions so timings are going to be a bit all over the place um happy to sort of I, I haven't got anything afterwards so if it does roll over i'm happy to sort of spend a bit of extra time so just do that sorry housekeeping anyway uh go back to the <laughs> course so coal names really really quick good name of way of getting your coal names um the dollar sign is if you just want to select a single column 
uh, of your data set, you can just do a data dollar sign type, which whereas if you look up here as well, we can do data and that's what this dollar sign period dollar sign type that's what that data dollar sign means so that's just pulling one column of our data out and if we assign that to an object it would just save that column as a vector um which can come in really really handy in in other things uh which we can have a look at um if we want to get uh, a list of unique data items in a variable, we can do unique uh, data type. So here where we looked at our, uh, our column, we had obviously it listed one to other across everything. But now we're just having a look at the unique value. So it's just looking at these are all the values within there. Again, really, really useful if you've got things like team names or regions or ICBs or whatever, and you just want to make sure that you've got, uh, you know, you just want to make sure that everything is covered within your data set. So as I said, um, the, the dollar sign allows us to call a specific column of a data set. What we can do is use some square brackets. And again, this is all really, really horrible base R stuff. Um, but we can call, for instance, the fourth entry within our column. So where we've got, uh, going back here, we've got one, two, other, one. Maybe we wanted to pull that specific one out. So we can do data type four, run that one, and it should come out with, there we go, we've got our one. And if we wanted to, we can also sort of slice our data to do uh, data type four to 10, and we could pull the, the fourth to 10th entries, okay? Um, I'll show you later why this become really, really uh, useful. Um, Python users, um, so this is one of those really big RV Python fights. Uh, Python slicing starts at zero and not one. So R counts the first thing as one, Python would count the first thing as zero. So if you wanted the fourth thing out of the list, you would do data type three in Python. But anyway, we're not doing Python, we're doing R, which uses much more intuitive um, stuff, which is correct, is debatable. Um, but let's just use some other quick commands. So if we were just wanted to count the number of distinct entries, we can do an N distinct. And so we know we've got one, two, and other. So this will tell us that there are three different uh, entries within our data set. Again, uh, you know, if we want to count, we've got a whole bunch of organization codes in our data. So if we want to know actually how many organization codes we've got, we can do data and distinct organization codes, and we can find out we've got 274 different organization codes. And if we want to know how many distinct, uh, you know, dates we've got in our uh, data set, we can do that and we can see we've got 36 distinct dates. Again, really, really useful when we've got a big, messy data set with 12,000 odd rows, just to make sure that we have got our 36 months worth of data, that we haven't got anything outside of that. Um, I guess going along with that is, um, you know, just finding the range of our data set. So again, this is really, really useful for our dates. So if we want to do range data uh, period, uh, we could see that our data set is ranging from, where are we, uh, April 2016 up to March 2019. Again, really, really nice, simple checking, you know, commands that we can just run on our data. Very much at that, just checking everything is has been pulled through in correctly type stage. Um, really nice function just to look at the structure of our data, which basically pulls through our data types. So this basically uh, just copies what's up here um, uh, and just make sure that, you know, we are sure that our, our date is a date. So if we are in doing any datey things on a date, then, you know, that, that's great. R very, very often, um, well, it's not very often, but it can get messed up with dates not coming in as dates and like, treating them as characters or numbers or various different things. So... Often, if you're doing something with a date and it doesn't do what you think it's done, it, it's because your carrot, your your data isn't in a date format. So just make sure it's a good way of checking that your data is in a, a date format. Uh, we can do things like look at the, you know, if we just want to eyeball the first 
five rows of the data we can do like a head function uh which let's just allows us to sort of see the first five rows uh actually six rows that's strange uh and likewise we could do tail if we want to see the the tail end of the data and that'll pull through the the last data and we can also add in a, a a number to our head so if we do data comma 15 that will bring back the first 15 the rows of the data um, that's using a base r function we can also use a, a dplyr function uh, which does top n uh, which is quite nice in that it it's, it's very specific it's top n and the n is obviously the number of we want to pull through uh, dplyr also allows us to do um, more interesting things so we can see the first 15 percent of our data rows data set so if we want to look at our top fraction that is pulling through uh where are we that would pull through 15 percent the first 15 percent of our data set it's not going to view it here but if i did assign it to uh top uh 15 Ooh, i can't spell that i told you i couldn't but oh my goodness me uh if i oh great there we go if we did a top 15 and assigned it to a, uh, an actual object, you can see that that's pulled through 1,019 uh, observations, which hopefully is 15% uh, of uh, 12,000, uh, whatever it is. So uh, we can do that. Uh, we can also uh, see the first 15% of our total rows of data, but ordered by attendances. So if we wanted to pick out what were our top 15 percent of attendances so again if we wanted to pull out our top i don't know top 10 results across a whole bunch of different things uh we could we could do this one uh, and again like i say it's not going to pull it through here but we can see that this is uh, now ordered by attendances and it's pulling through our top 15 percent based on attendances it hasn't reordered them in here but it will be our top 15 percent based on our attendances so see if you can work out um if you can find the lowest five attendances so uh obviously that's pulled through the top uh five we want to now bring through the five lowest so just to say how this is going to work, like I say, I'm going to do a, a bunch of stuff, show you some bits and pieces, and then it will be there's some gaps in this code where it's over to you where you can have a go and uh, see if you can you can do it. So, big big clue is to go to the uh, the help screen maybe and look at this top fraction uh, top frac uh, function and see if it gives you any clues of how you might do it so that it's the bottom or how you might want to do the inverse of top. It's probably a really nasty one to start you on. I'm really sorry about that. Um. <laughs> I'm also really terrible judging about how long these things take. So um, if I do move on and you haven't quite finished, my massive apologies and do shout at me at any point if you do think I'm going massively too fast. So... Uh, we don't want top frack, do we? We want... Uh, Top N, sorry. Because we want the actual five results. So doing our question mark top N, hopefully you will find the answer to what you want to do. So did everybody managed to find that. So
So we've got uh, our arguments are x, n, and w, t, uh, a value, a value of the variable to use for ordering. So we've got our x, which is our data. We've got our n, which is our number. We want to find five, and we want to base it on attendances. And it says number of returns thing. Uh, blah, 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 blah. If n is positive, returns the top loads. If negative, uh, selects the bottom rows. So we want the bottom five rows. So literally, we can put a minus in there. And ta-da, it brings us back the five lowest attendances. Did everybody get that? Or does anybody not get how we got there? No, nope. all good. Excellent. So um, again, really, really nice functions. You can also feed those into pipes and they work within dplyr. So if you wanted to then filter your data down to the, you know, the top 10% of results or your bottom work, you know, your, your, your worst five teams for a, uh, a KPI or, or whatever, you know, that, that would do it and you wouldn't have to sort of manually do it in a, in a, in a different way. So that's, that's really good. Um, so summary on our data is a really nice little function uh let me just make it a little bit wider and run it again so summary um basically just takes your data and just runs some very simple summary stats on it and and it's really really quite useful for uh seeing what's going on so where we've got our our time period and it adjusts to the data as you go along so it's given us our min and our max it's kind of told us what our our mean and median is not sure whether that's strictly correct for our, our time period but it will at least sort of show us where we've got a, a skew i guess to you know are we missing earlier data or later data um where we've got an organization code it's just going to give us where we've got a categorical data it's just going to give us the counts and numbers it's not going to go through them all and it's just saying look there's 108 of these and there's also sort of 12,000 other things where we have got a straight category and it's a simple one it was just tell us that we've got the, the counts of our type ones and type twos and our type others so again that sort of tells us how many uh, data points we've got for each of those where we've got actual sort of numeric data, again, this is quite useful. It tells us our min and our max, and also sort of our mean and medians and our quartiles, so that we can see attendances. Yeah, we've got a mean, but we've also got somewhere we've got some, uh, uh, you know, uh, mins of one, which is uh, quite interesting. And also for our breaches and emissions, we can see we've got mins of zero, so we've definitely got some some zeros. Um, if we had some NAs in our data sets, uh, then it, this would also uh, tell us how many nulls we've got by each of the, the columns. I haven't got any in this data set, but it would do that. So again, really, really nice, quick, uh, you know, I just want a very, very quick and dirty look at my data set. Summary is a really, really good thing just to tell you if you've got any missing values, et cetera, uh, with, within that. Um, the other thing is that summary is a fantastic thing. It works across a whole load of different types of things. So even if you've got like linear or regression models, you can feed a regression model into a summary and it will give you beautiful summary statistics over it. Anyway, uh, not going to go massively into linear models now. That's for another day. Um, table. Tables are really, really nice. Uh, again, quick and dirty. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, base R function. So if we just want to look at our data and our type and we can do table, it will just do a very, very quick count by each of the different types about how many there are in uh, in in each of those areas. So um, it, will, it will do those. We can also feed in two columns into it so we can look at our data type by org code. So this will, it's quite a massive thing, but basically it will just give us a split for each of these uh, different organizations, how many type ones, how many type twos, and how many others they've got. So um, we can just sort of eyeball here that, you know, we've got some sites where we've got sort of equal amounts of all of them. We've also got some sites where there's, they've only got others. And we've also got some sites where they look like they've only got like 12 months of, of data. So again, it's it's you know it's not publication ready, but it's a it's a really quick and dirty way of getting a, a summary up of your data data set, and just saying you know have I got 
how many uh, you know how many how many counts of things have I got in certain categories and you can do cross reference of those is is really good. You can feed three columns into the table um, function, but it does get quite silly. So okay, let's start using some actual dplyr and um, having a, a bit of a play with some bits and pieces. So we're going to use pipes. Um, I'm assuming everybody has done sort of introduction to R or vaguely know how to use um, uh, uh, dplyr. For those people who haven't done the sort of introductory course and are possibly a bit old school, we are going to be using pipes, which is this, which is the same as the old school this. Um, so the the button for the, the pipe is shift and it's the bottom left hand key of your keyboard next to your Z key and then greater than and that's your pipe. There is a keyboard shortcut to it, but I never use it. So I forget. Anyway, so we're going to. Uh, control shift N, Simon. Sorry? Uh, control shift N. Control shift N. See, I just find that that's probably just as many keystrokes as typing it. Long yeah, hand. but if, if you previously used the shortcut for the old Microsoft pipe, then it, it's probably ingrained. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I never did, so <laughs> it's not ingrained for me. But if you do, uh, Control Shift then. So let's reorganize. Let's rename our our data set, and we're going to do something really awful, which is really bad practice. Is we're going to change our lovely snake case org code into this abomination where very often when you are importing stuff from Excel, you've got a column name and it's got a space in it because in Excel, you can give things lovely spaces in their variable names because it's within that cell. So it still treats it as all one thing. R, however, obviously will a, a will not be happy that you've got a space. So if you want a, a variable name with a space in it, you have to put it in these back ticks, which is a very hard word to say is back tick, because I always say bat tick, which just is wrong. So back tick is, again, extremities of your keyboard. It's the top left-hand side next to your one key. So if we just run this code, uh, doesn't still look like it's done anything majorly exciting, but if we look at our data here, doo -doo -doo -doo, we can now see we've got an organization code as our column heading. But if we want to refer to it at any point, we've got to put it into these into these uh, back ticks. Um, so let's just organize uh, rename uh, some more of our stuff into hideous hideous names. Um, even even worse, we're going to do a tr we're going to do a, a a trading not a trading space a, a prefixed space of a uh, of a uh, of a column name. So let's just rename those as well. And if we remember how to do our col names data, we can see we've got some real mismatch of of stuff. In, in our data frame. So yeah, if anybody you work for NHS England, then you'll recognize this because this is just like common stuff we have across our data sets. I'm sure out in the world, in in, in you provider land, you've all got beautiful, uh, well-curated data sets. But um, anyway, so we've got here, we've got a horrible, we've got a data frame now, which has got a whole load of different you know, formats, et cetera, of, 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 of names. So what we want to do is tidy those all up. So I'm going to introduce you to my friend Janitor, which is a wonderful library. So we are going to install our Janitor package, which hopefully is pretty quick. So that's up to tools, install packages, and Janitor. I could have included it at the start, or we could have installed it right at the start, and that's fine if you if you did. Um, but we uh, we just going to install it manually as we go. Um, it does do. Uh, it's got a few weird little quirks in that it does it. It has got a chi squared and a Fisher test, and for whatever reasons, those are masked. But anyway, we're not going to be doing any chi squared or Fisher test, so we're all good. So my favorite function in the world, uh, which I probably load in Tidyverse and I load in Janitor, 
is the clean names function. So let's just have a, another quick look at our data set up here. We have got our period, all code. We've got all these crazy different things. And we are just going to apply the clean names function to it. And now when we look at it, it has cleaned them all. So it's changed them all into snake case. It's got rid of the um it's got rid of the space beforehand. It's turned all our spaces into underscores. Um, it's put them all into sort of uh, a snake case. If we had anything as crazy of, as having like hashes or explanation marks or anything like that in there, it would remove them. If we had any variable names that started with a number, it would it would remove them and, and change them into something nicer. So clean names is one of my absolute favorite, uh, favorite uh, libraries. So I'm gonna do a very, very quick over to you. So let's have a quick name at renaming breaches to number of breaches and then put it back again. And there is a hint there around the order of the rename. That's a hint for me because I know I always do it the wrong way around. So again, this is where we do our lovely back text. And it's the order of it. So our new name is equal to our old name. For some reason in my head, I always think it's the way around, but it's not. So when we do that, we should now have uh no of breaches. Oh, I said number, didn't I? No, anyway, it should be number there. And then I want to change it back again. Hopefully we are back there. That makes sense. I don't know. I like to say that the rename, the order that you put the new variable and the old variable always froze me, but it's just to show you those horrible back ticks. So, um, can I just ask you about the back ticks? So I'm used yeah. to using quotation marks instead. Yeah. Is that exactly the same? No, because <laughs> um, I tried it in my code and it didn't work for this, but it says other times it doesn't work. Then, so does that do the job? I think it does. So you can do it that way. Back ticks is generally used for things with spaces. So yeah, you can use um, speech marks. It does work the same way. Um, but speech marks are usually used in other areas. So I don't know. I, so yeah, you can use speech marks. There's, there's nothing stopping you. It's a bit like the difference between using uh, a data and assignment operator rather than using equals to. It's it's more of a convention thing. So okay. it's not wrong. It's not wrong. It's just convention. So yeah, I was just always taught that if you're using a variable name with with spaces in, that you use back ticks because then you know it's a variable name. Quite often when we're doing things like filtering and things like that, we would use, um, you know, we would use speech marks to, to you know, talk about a string. So just keep them separate. But, you know, it's 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 convention rather than a, a hard and fast rule. Um, just to say, Janitor's also got some other fantastic uh, features that you can do with it does some really nice thing around finding duplicate rows and adding quick totals into things. If for whatever reason you've imported a, an Excel sheet and it's pulled through those, you know, when it converts a, a date into a number, 
it's got a really good function that converts uh, Excel dates into uh, into dates. But yeah, definitely, definitely check out the janitor package. It's got some really nice stuff in there. So let's have a look at the select statement. So very simply, when we do a data select, very much like a, a SQL select, we are just selecting certain columns of our data set. So if we do data select and the data, oh, uh, oh, have I changed all code? What have I done here? Have I not got all code? No, I've got organization code. I'm a very bad man. So for those of you who have not changed your organization code back to org code, let's do that. Rename uh, org code equals organization code. And I've done it backwards, haven't I? No. I can't spell. What have I got? There we go. I can't spell. So there we go. <laughs> Another example of why I use call names a lot to get my call names, and then I can copy and paste them into my code. So, yeah, make sure you have renamed your org code back to org code. Sorry about that. Let's try this again. So it's all about making mistakes and learning from them. So now when I do my data select, I've just selected my period and my org code. You can see here that I've got two variables now, and that's period and org code. So that's great. Um, what we can also do is what's the difference there uh, uh oh we can also do org code so yeah if we look at our data select it has done period org code but if we choose org code then period uh and we go to our data select it will order them in that order. So select is another way that we can reorder columns. Um, it's not necessarily the, the most efficient if we are just wanting to change one or two columns um, or if we've got a whole load of columns we can we can change. Yeah, so if you want to change like one or two columns and just sort of swap a, a column over, there is a uh, there is a re I can't remember what it's called now. Is it is it reorder? Yeah, it is reorder. Um, there is a reorder function. I haven't done anything on there. I probably should do something around that at a, a later date. We're just going to do select, but select will allow us to have a look at our our data set. Oops, there we go. Um, as you can see, I have included view uh, data select here, and obviously that brings up our data, and we can have a look at it. I'm sure you know you can click on it up here as well. Uh, really, really nice thing you can do is obviously you can just call the name of the data select here, and that will bring through um, a sort of a, a head version of it. Obviously, you can click over it on the other side. And then my absolute favorite is just to hold down the control button and click on a, an object. And that will also view the the object and there we go and it's refused to connect which is nice i don't know what's going on there let's just try that again weird uh, and that will do so if you've got any objects that you've created you can just press the control button and then click on them anywhere and it will bring up the view so that's that's really useful um we can also uh, do a simple rename within our uh, our select statement. So this is very much uh, sort of SQL uh, like, um, as in we want to do uh, a SQL. Except this is probably where I get my backwards in is that we're adding it, so we're doing it like a SQL alias, but we are doing it backwards. So rather than such and such as thingy with a uh, variable as new name, we're doing new name equals old name. So this will allow us to uh, rename our period and our organization. And then if we look at our data select, within our data select now, 
we've renamed our, our, our select statements. Uh, we can also do a, a, a exclamation mark or a minus for a negative select. So if we want to take our data and not select organization and period, uh, that should then bring up everything apart from organization and period. So it's it's pulled through everything else. Um, we can not do multiple singular things. So if we try this, it will run, but when we look at it, so we're trying to tell it to pull back not all code and not period, but it has done. It's So that doesn't work. However, a minus does work. So we can select individual things and do a minus period and minus uh, org code. So if we run that, it will remove those. Not quite sure why that is. It's a little quirk within the, the select statement. Um, but yeah, anybody goes that. So anyway, that's a good way yeah. of, you know, so, if you've got really big yeah, decks, Simon, Hello. Do you have to use like the logical operators, like the, I mean, the ampersand? bracket the condition of the select to make it work with the um, not yeah, sorry like if you use the ampersand with the exclamation point then would that work in brackets uh so, so do it as an and yeah yeah with yeah and those in brackets as well no yeah can... i don't know let's find out Um, no, yes, yeah, yeah, that does work it that way. So, yeah, I think that works more as a logical operator. I would find that really difficult to read personally, but obviously, that does work. That is a, a, an alternative way of doing it. Um, where select becomes a little bit more interesting is that we can add some verbs into our select statement and do some cleverer things which allows us to do much more sort of dynamic stuff around our data set. So we can do a data set select and just contain, uh, so we can do a contains, so we can pull any column that contains ES. Uh, so if we run that and look at our data select, that's now pulled back our attendance as and our number of breaches. So both of those contain the ES string and we've just selected those. So again, if you've tagged your column names with certain things, you can just say, I just want to tag the, or can have the, the, the column names that contain certain things. Likewise, you can do that as a whoop, uh, not contains, uh, which, is, which is quite nice. Um, and we can do that, and that will pull back everything that doesn't contain that, that ES. Uh, we can also look at the data types. Uh, and again, this is where we start getting quite quite interesting in that if we just want to pull back any of our columns where they are numeric, um, we can pull those through. So if we just pull through our data select, that's just pulled through our numeric column. So you can actually sort of query on the metadata of the column, uh, which again, is really, really quite powerful. Um, and then we can also do things like uh, and add an everything on, on there. So if we want to sort of reorder our columns, we want emissions first, then we want breaches, and then we just want everything else. Uh, it will it will do that for us. Uh, oh, and I've not got breaches because I've still called my number of breaches because I'm a silly person. Uh, so let me just go right back up to the top here. And I'm just going to rename my remake my data set so it's absolutely back to the uh, the base one. Uh, where are we? We are. My goodness me, there's a lot of this stuff. There we go. Uh, and then I'm going to do my everything here and uh, do my data select. So it's done my emissions and breaches and type and others. Uh, Another good thing to do, if you ever get stuck in your code, and I usually do this, if especially if I'm scrolling up and down and I'm trying to do something in the middle, I'll do a hash ZZZ. And when I've gone back up here and I've uh, I found the bit I wanted to do, I've wanted to rerun, uh, I've wanted to rerun this bit. 
And I go, great, but where was I in this code? Uh, there is a control F for a find, which does do a find and replace, but I can just do my control uh, Z, 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 and I can find my little place and work out where I was again and then delete that. Um, very handy little hint that I use, especially when you've got big convoluted uh, wobbly code uh, like I write. So uh, cool, what have we got? We've gone over to you. So select any data so that it is in the order of admissions and then any column that is the factor and then anything else. Blimey. So we want to select the data. So we want to select admissions first. Then we want to check whether we want to pull back any columns that there are factors. And then we just want to return any of the other columns. So have a go at that. So very much kind of adding these two together. And then we'll do the next section. What time do we start half a sign? Uh, yeah, and then we'll think about having a quick 10 minute break. So we we'll admissions first. Then we want anything that is a factor. And then we want everything else. And then hopefully that's pulled through. Our admissions are all codes and types are factors. We're going to talk about factors later. And then it's pulled through everything else. It, Everybody get that. Yeah, we're good. Do shout. So this is your your course, your chance to ask questions if you don't understand. Please, please don't feel there are no silly questions. So um for those who've who've done like the introductory to our uh, course and probably done other bits and pieces. We've covered, I think that sort of covers off left and right joins. Uh, I think we even do crazy things like semi joins and good gives me what well, I can't remember the, the weird negative join in anti join. That's the word I'm looking for. We did some weird anti joins, uh, which were which were which were crazy. Um, but we're just going to do some concatenation. So we're not doing a join per se. We are simply bolting one data set onto another data set and we're not joining them we are concatenating them so literally pasting some data onto an existing format at the bottom of the sheet basically in in excel terms so this is all about joining tables but without doing sort of relational keys just literally bolting one table onto another so we're going to create a, a df1 which is just our first data frame which is just going to be, um, what's it going to be? It's just going to be a very, very simple. It's just going to be a cut of six observations of, of our data set. And then data frame two is going to be similar, uh, but we haven't got the same number of variables. So we've got virtually the same. We've got attendances, breaches, and admissions. But what we haven't got is, what haven't we got? Uh, Oh, right, we haven't got period or code or type. All we've got is attendances, which is the same across the data sets. So we want to bolt one uh, uh, top to the other. Actually, no, we're not going to. We're going to bolt them side by side to start with. So we're going to do a column bind. So we are not uh, we're not joining it on the bottom. We're joining it to the side of our data set. So let's have a look at that so we're doing our df new which is going to be a c bind for column bind and column bind our one and our two together and if we look at three now we can see we've still got six observations so we've still got our same six rows but now instead of uh 
we've now bound our three and our four, which hopefully you can see is our seven variables now. And if we look at our df new, we can see we've bolted on, literally copied one to the other. In our example, both of them had attendances in them. So R has gone, we've got a duplicate. It doesn't like duplicate column names in, in a data frame. So it's just given them an, an additional one. So it hasn't merged them or anything like that. It's literally put one next to the other one and it's given it a, a new name. So if we want to merge it or something like that, then that would be where we would do a left join on our attendances or, or something like that was probably what we were doing. But in this instance, we're literally bolting two together. So let's just have uh, another look at something. So we're going to create some new data frames here. This time they are the same number of observations and variables. So we've just got our, uh, our head, which is that, and then it's just our tail. And this time we want to bolt them one on top of the other. So we are going to do a uh, bind rows and chuck those on. And if we look at our new data set now, now we've got one data set and we have literally bolted one on top of the other. So we've got uh, a new data frame in that format. So, um, so let's do a slightly, uh, slightly weird version. So let's have a look at creating, we want to bolt some data onto the bottom of our, uh, of our, our existing data. So let's just run that one. And then we are going to have a look at this one. So this time, We've got our data frame one, which has only got our four variables. So that's just got our period org code and type and attendances. And our DF2, which has got our attendances, breaches, uh, sorry, breaches and admissions in there as well. And this time we're going to uh, bind them together. And what we get is not that. Uh, did I not run that? There we go. Uh, it's jumped them on together, and where they've matched, they it's obviously put them into the right columns. But where we've got a, a non-match, it's basically put NAs in there, so uh, the equivalent of nulls in there, because we didn't have any data which which fitted in there. So even though we've got that incomplete data, it will sort of bolt them together as as best we can and put nulls in there. So it's not put a zero in there. It's literally put a null because there is no data in there at all. So hopefully that makes sense. Hi, so, Simon. Sorry, I did get zeros instead of NAs. Have I done something wrong? Uh, well, if we run these ones again. So what might happen is, and I think I have this happen to me sometimes. I don't know. It's a new thing on our studio, and I'm not sure it always works. Sometimes you have to sort of close your little tab down at the top here. And then reopen it. Yeah. Oh, it's done it now, yeah. Yeah, from you. It seems to keep the old ones for some reason. It doesn't always refresh your view, um, which is weird. I don't know why it's done it, but yeah. So it's it's right now. Cool. So over to you. Uh create a data frame with the top five admissions only, and then the bottom five attendances only, and join the two columns to so we want to find the highest five admissions and the lowest five admissions uh, sorry attendances all right yeah bottom, top five admissions and the bottom five attendances and then join those two columns together so crazily we're going to go back to something we did pretty earlier So with our data frames.
really poor question. I do apologise. And the answer does not make any sense whatsoever. So I just want my admissions. That's all I want in this first data frame. And I want the top five based on those admissions. I mean, I guess I've only got admissions, so uh, <laughs> that will be fine. And then I want to do the equivalent for my DF2. What am I doing for this one? Attendance. We should hopefully have something that looks like that. So that's my highest number of admissions and my lowest number of attendances just in a separate little mini data frame, which I guess could be useful if you've got, I don't know, uh, KPIs where some of them are high is good and some of them are low is good and you want to sort of do a mix and match sort of combine and have some sort of summary at the end of, of just who are your top top five and, and, and bottom five performers as it were so where are we on next everybody got that did that sort of make sense i do apologize like i said we're going to be butchering this data set and coming out with some really weird questions which make no sense but hopefully it was just enough to to get the intuition around what we're doing Okay, we we'll just do one more little thing, or uh, I'll just run through this and then we'll take a quick break. So if you want to uh, combine, as I say, columns of different sizes and you want to obviously combine them specifically, then yeah, you want to go down to join. Uh, you know, left join is probably your friend for the for majority of things. Uh, you can do, there is a, like a union function. Um, which does work slightly differently to a SQL union. So if we look at the union function, uh, so we're going to rename uh, uh, breaches to admissions to create some duplicates, uh, which is very, very frustrating and very, very annoying. Um, and then we're going to, so if we look at our DF1, We are going to create a data frame with our org code and our admissions. And then we are going to create uh, another one where we've got a DF2, Ooh. new DF2, which is also called org name and admissions. Just be aware though, obviously I've renamed admissions to breach uh, breaches to admissions in this data frame so it's not actually the admissions so what i've deliberately done is made some duplicates so we've got organization code with admissions and it might appear in both of these data frames and it is basically joins those together and drop anything and drops the duplicate 765 and uh 12765 for df one and two when we've unioned them it's joined them together and then drops any duplicates um and i think it just takes precedent that gf1 is the first one so that one will take thing uh take precedence and if there's anything from df2 which is a duplicate on on the organization name it's just going to drop it so it's only going to pull in those where it's it's got additional uh value so 
union in in R works really strangely and really differently. So just be really, really care, careful around that. Um, what we can do is use some quite nice intersect functions. So we can have a look between two data frames and see where we have got um, identical columns. So if we have a look at that and we look at our DF intersect, this will tell us that we've got, these are our intersects. So these are where we've got identical columns uh, between the two data frames. Uh, we can also do the inverse of that and see where we've got rows that don't exist in either table. So we can see where the differences between the tables are. And this gives us where we've got unique values across the table. So RF1 only appears in one table and not the other. So again, if you've got two tables where you think they should be the same and they're not the same uh, for whatever reason, the set diff will basically tell you there uh, the rows where you've got differences which again is a really, really nice way of, of just doing simple comparisons between uh, two different things. So we are at 11 o'clock. Look at me, I'm so brilliant with time. Let's take a quick 10 minute break. Um, if there's any of that you didn't get, please feel free to either give me a quick shout now. Otherwise go and have a, a quick 10 minute break um, and then we'll come back at 10 past. Just to say within uh, using group buys within mutates and summarize. So again, this is something that came, uh, I think it's only about, I don't know, it's probably about 12 months old now within dplyr, is that you can do the group buy within the summarize and mutate. Uh, for those people who have done a recent introduction to our course, this is how we teach it now. Uh, but this is more for the sort of the old school people who have, have, have learned the, the old fashioned way. Uh, so old school way would be to get your data and do a group by type and then do a summarize and then ungroup it. Excuse me. Uh, and that would give us our sort of date of our summaries of our counts of one, twos and others. The, the new way of doing that is to have a dot by within your summarize command, which basically takes that old data and just runs exactly the same and uh, if we do data all as i should say data new that's very naughty uh, and we go back to it it will be exactly the same so this will have exactly the same as result by this data likewise if we wanted to do uh, you can do a group by and we're doing mutates and we'll come back to some of that later um very much i think when we were teaching uh within the the introduction to R, we show you how to do group by for summarize but you can also do group by within mutates so if we wanted to group by the type and double our admissions and uh, sort of run that through, we'll do some examples of this later, It'll make much more sense. Um, we can we can sort of double our admissions by each of the each of the types. Um, likewise, if we were going to be doing that in a, in a mutate, we can do our dot by within a mutate. We're going to do some examples on that later where instead of doing a summary across our data set, maybe we want to create a percentage uh, across each um, uh, uh, time period and each um, uh, organization, but have a percentage of emissions so we can work out looking at our basic data. Uh, well, I'll come to it later. But maybe we wanted to know, uh, we've got our period and we've got our reach, uh, our organization code and we've got these are the number of attendances. Perhaps we want to group it by these and then work out of this 21,000, what is that as a percentage of the entire amount of attendances for that grouping? And we'll do that. We'll do that in a minute. Um, anyway, so just to show you some other very, very quick dplyr stuff, um, uh, this is like the tidy version. Uh, this is like the tidy ver version of, of table. Uh, so we can do data is our data count and then just do a count by type. And if we pull that through, uh, we can see what that looks like. If it wakes up, the one's going really, really slow. Oh my goodness me. What? That's been weird. Let's just close some of this stuff. There we go. And that's very much like the um, 
the, the the table function I showed earlier, where it's just doing a count of of uh, the types. Uh, we can also do um, so. Yeah, that would be the same as doing a summarize and uh, a count by. So that would come with exactly the same results. Um, and then we can also create a uh, a new column and add count a bit like a mutate, where we're adding a, a count by each of the column uh, by each of the uh, organization codes. So now if we look at our organization code, we've got a new column called M and we can see that organization code RF4 has 104, 108 entries within this entire data set. RF1 has 108 um, and that's just going to be our total. Obviously it's going to be repeated across each of those rows where it's uh, it's it's thing. So if we wanted to know specifically just how many uh, RF4s at numbers that we, we would do that first um, count here and we could change that to uh, org type rather than um, count or we could do a counter instead of count type we could do count org code and that would give us our count by org code I'm sure I've made that a hundred times more complicated than it should have been uh, sorry <laughs> so let's have a quick look at our data count now and that should give us a summary table and tell us how many times each of the organization codes have submitted uh, and we can see the differences there cool so let's do some fancy filtering so um i'm sure we've just done some very very basic filtering before where we have filtered and we can filter a value where um we 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 filtered a value say you know we filter our data where it's above 500 or below 700 or, or whatever but we can do some a little bit more interesting things so we're going to do a string detect which is part of the tidyverse is the stringy um package or no string r package not stringy um which allows us to do a string detect on our organization code that contains an R. So if you look at our organization codes, they're all sort of like three or four letter things. And this is just going to pull through any of the organization codes which contain an R. Likewise, if you sort of tag your data in certain ways, uh, this will be a really good way to sort of pull through certain things. So if we look at our filtered data, all our organization codes now either start with an R or have got an R in them at some point. Um, I don't think I've got any. Have I got some that I've got an R at another? I don't know. Maybe they all start with R. But anyway, if there was an R at any point, it would pull those through. Maybe uh, we want to filter our data to the latest date period per organization code. So we've got a whole load of organization codes here in our data set, but we want to we want to work out what is the latest each of our organizations have submitted data. Uh, so this one's probably much, much more useful. So we know that some of these organizations haven't um, submitted data. So we want to know what is the last time they've submitted data. So we're going to take our data and our period. We want to be the maximum period, but grouped by the organization. So for each organization, what is the latest period that they have submitted? Sorry, the sun has just come straight my eyes. Let's just shut that one down. So now this nice filter has pulled through each of the organization codes, and this is the latest date that they have submitted data into our data set. So that's that's really quite uh, an interesting and powerful thing where we have got, just to look out, does it pull through duplicates? It should do. We've got, um, let me see. So if we've got duplicates on the types, just try and find one. Uh, yes, there we go, this one here. So this has got uh, duplicates on the types and it is pulled through uh, the, the thing. If they've submitted different, if for whatever reason, uh, it doesn't appear in the state, so if there's a different submission for each type and they've submitted a different uh, date for each of the types so maybe they haven't submitted their type twos for march 19 we could group it by those two things so it will bring back 
the latest for each period and for each type, uh, if that makes sense. So again, this this doing this group by within the filter, you can start doing some really quite funky things. Uh, we could do an and, um, so you can don't have to filter by just one thing. Uh, so we want to filter where type is one and attendances are over ten thousand. So that's probably quite straightforward, and we can do have a look at our data. So we've only got type one, and we've only got attendances. And I'm sure if we uh, do that, we can see when we've ordered them that they are all over ten thousand. Let me scroll down to the bottom. Yep, it's only pulled through where we've got. Oh, it's a bit backwards now. Go back up here. Uh, yeah. It's only filtered those where, so it's meeting two conditions and you can separate your conditions with a comma and you can just add in lots in those. Uh, we can also use an or operator. So we wanna know any type ones or where the attendances are over 10,000. So it'll bring back where either of those are true. And we can use an or, so we can use the, there is an or, or the cool kids use the, um, the the line function, which is the same as they use with the operator, but obviously without the thing, and that uh, that creates an or. So if we look at that one, and we look at our data filter, we have got any of our type ones or attendances over uh, ten thousand. So it's pulled through some of these others where we've got attendances over 10,000. So again, you can start doing quite funky things with, with ORs. I'd be really, really careful with ORs, um, especially same as with SQL. I would I would definitely recommend not using them if you can avoid them. If you can think of a logic that avoids using an OR, always do because they they they, no, they, they trip you up. Anyway, so let's have a look. Can you write a script to check if we only have one row, if we have one row per org? If we have not, return only those where we have more than one row. And for bonus points, put them in order by number of rows. Oh my goodness me, he wrote this. Um, let's see if I can help with the question. So what do we want to do? We want to... Uh, okay okay that's not so yeah so going back over what we've just done so we want to know have we got one row per organization code so easiest way to do that is to count so going back to our little table of counts by organization so if they if we count them and they've got more than one, then that will be that will be true. Um, and we also want to filter them if possible, um, where we've got more than one row. And and for bonus points, put them in order by number of rows. So again, have a look potentially at our uh, F1 function or our help function. Um, which possibly might reveal some extra little things that some of the, uh, the, the this function can do. So apologies for the absolutely hideously worded question. Um, and I would use um, the data field. No, I don't know. I think you can use data. Like, yeah.
So, so as I said, please, please shout if I'm giving you too much or too little time on this. So uh, let's start step by step. So we've got our data filter. I'm just going to remove that bit. And the first thing we want to do is just count our numbers of entries. So rather than sort of doing count of rows or whatever, we can just do a data filter, which gives us our number of, of, of counts, uh, which is great. So that gives us our counts. Um, then we can add in a filter, which I did here. And we can do filter our n is greater than one. And we just do that. And that's obviously filtered our, our ones out. We could go old school and use a bit of dplyr and do our arrange uh, an n and just arrange by, by, by n. And that obviously that would work. And there's no problem with that. Ooh, where are we? So there's no problem with that. Let's go back into it. Uh, there's no problem with that. That's arranged it. Uh, but also, if you went for bonus points and looked at your count function, so I'm going to hover over it and press F1, which will bring up the count functions. It does come up with a sort option. So we can also call it sort equals true. Um, it also calls it by default is n. So maybe we just want to call it, uh, where is it? Name equals uh, num rows. And then we would have to filter our n number rows is greater than one. So I'm going for extra, extra credit, and I'm cheating. So there we go. Uh, now I've got my org code and my number of rows, and i am also filtered it to my number of rows is greater than one. Does that make sense? Any issues there? Um, I'll happily, like I say, you can copy this. I'll happily make sure that my version where I've added these extra bits is also available to you, and I'll happily sort of send those out to you as well. If, if you so wish. And like I said, the whole idea of this workbook is we're sort of going to whiz through it, but hopefully it will be there that you can uh, you know, go back and, and, and take things out of it. So conditionals. Uh, so very, very basic. We want to do like an if else statement. So we're going to take our data and we want to add in a new column. So we're going to add a, a mutate and we're going to create a new column called above 20,000 and it's going to check our attendances and where our attendances are equal to or greater than, I should probably just call that greater than because I've called that above. Anyway, we'll come back to that later. Um, and where it's above 20,000, I want to give it a Y. And where it's below, where it doesn't meet that criteria, it's going to give it an N. So it's going to give us a little flag on our data set. So if we go back to our data now, we should have now a new flag on it. Do, 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 do. There we go. And where we've got attendances above 20,000, we've got a Y, and where the attendances are below, it will give us an N. So again, really, really simple conditional, and we can, you know, we 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 can do things like that. Obviously, at the moment, I'm just adding in a simple Y and N. You can tell it to trigger certain functions. So if it's above 20,000 times it by two. If it's below 20,000, you know, divide it by two, uh, something like that, if you if you so watch. The only thing you've got to be really, really mindful of is that your outputs for your conditions are the same data type. So what it won't like is if it's, uh, if it's true, give it a Y, but if it's false, give it a one. In, and it won't like that because I'm crossing the streams and I'm missing, I'm mixing up data types. So it will not like that. Um, so yeah, oh, literally look at me. I've already given myself an example here and it will throw a wobble and it will literally, again, really, really nice error message that it's telling me exactly what it doesn't like. It, it's telling me I can't combine my true, which is a double 
with my false, which is a character. So you can't can't mix the can't mix the streams there. So that's really good if you've just got like a if this then that if else type statement because that's literally what it's called is an if else statement. Um, and I'm sure what we want is probably a much much cleverer conditional, uh, a bit like we can do within SQL where we can do a case statement. Um, so we do a multiple condition. So we're going to create a grouping for our attendances. So we're going to create a grouping. So we're going to give it some text to say what our groupings are. So if attendances are less than 5,000, we're going to say less than 5,000, yada, yada, yada. Uh, oh, I haven't changed this, which is really naughty. Sorry, I should have updated this. Um, and I will do so. So they've changed how this works, and I haven't updated it in this uh, tutorial, which is very naughty, but I will come back to that later. Um, so we have now got a new attendance grouping, which is based on our attendances, and it's given it uh, a, a, a thing. Basically, it's saying it's it's running through in order. If attendances are less than twenty thousand, uh, five thousand, say this. If it's less than twenty five thousand, yada yada yada. And then finally, at the end, we've got like an else statement, which is basically our true statement, and saying if it's none of those, then use this. The modern method. Uh, so this is a bit like the the group by and the um, do that. We do dot default equals well I would help if I spelled default correctly um is is the is the more modern way and to be honest possibly makes it a little bit more readable uh, and, and understandable so this is saying this is the default but if it meets any of these criteria then then use those um so do uh do do copy that in there. I think my examples throughout are going to use the old school. Both work identically. Um, they've just changed the syntax slightly. Um, and I think I prefer the dot default, the new one. I'm not sure, but obviously I'm still writing it old school. So um, that's great. But I don't know if any of you eagle-eyed analysts have spotted the deliberate mistake here, um, which is, what is my deliberate mistake? Ah, yes, there we go. Uh, is if my value was exactly 25,000, uh, my, de my default is saying that it's over 25,000. And we're going to be really, really pedantic about these things, you know, and we're analysts, so therefore we absolutely should be really pedantic about these things. Uh, that's going to be incorrect. But I'm going to absolutely coerce uh, uh, an issue into our data set. So I'm going to change my underlying data. So where my data attendance is at position one, I'm going to change that to be 25,000. Exactly. So now when I run my data set and we look at my data and I refresh my data and then have a look at look at it. I can see now I've changed this attendances to be exactly 25,000. And yet my grouping says it's over 25,000. And as I said, really, really pedantic analyst. So I'm not happy with that being correct. Um, just to say when we, because uh, I haven't mentioned it here, is this bit. So I've obviously written loads of notes myself here uh, and comments is this is called the tilde function of tilde key. It is found above the hash key next to your return. So it's shift and hash. And it basically in this in this scenario means uh, a then or, or is type of thing. So when attendances are less than 5,000, then the, re the result that we want is less than 5,000, etc. So hopefully you can understand the case statements are like the multiple if else with multiple conditions. So I've made a deliberate issue. So now I'm going to do a uh, even more deliberate issue is I'm going to create a null in my data set. So now when I look at my data set, uh, go back here. I've, obviously, I've not attended. I've not changed my groupings yet. Um, I've now got a null 
uh, in there. So now when I run this, uh, and I look at my data and make sure I refresh it, it is still going to tell me that my null is over 25,000 because the criteria that it's meeting is it's, well, null is not less than 5,000. It's not less than 10,000, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, by default, it's over 25,000. So that's a real, well, that's a real admission on my part. Terrible coding, a terrible piece of uh, code there. Let's not do that. So let's be more absolutely specific around our data set and say, all right, let's 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 do uh, our our default. Let's just change that to a dot default. is error does not compute. So we're going to say, by default, it's error not compute, does not compute. However, if it meets one of those criteria, then it will come through as, as a correct thing. So let's run that one. And I will just close that one down and refresh my data. And now where I've got an, uh, an NA, it's coming through as error does not compute. Great. Let's go back and put in my exactly 25,000 and then run my data again. And have a look at that. And likewise, because I wrote that really bad case statement with that crazy little edge case where if something is exactly 25,000, it doesn't go through. Again, that's given me that error does not compute. So what I want to do then is change that to uh, greater than equals and run that one. Uh, and I should do 25,000 plus really to be, to be correct pedantic about these things and run that and have a look at not my data count because have a look at my data and now I've got my 25,000 and it's telling me it is 25,000 plus hooray so I am now correct and if I had a null in there so let's just feed uh, a null in there in position two and run that one through. So it should now pick up my 25,000 and see that that one's correct. And it should throw a wobble on line two because I've got an NA in there and show me I've got an error does not compute, which is perfect, which is exactly what it does. Cool. So as you can see, it's it's best to make sure your default is, you know, a, an error message in some way that you can, you know, pick up on those and, and realize you've got something that doesn't fit your 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 case statement um and, and and whatever so in this instance we were just changing our mutation to just bring back a string uh, we don't have to do that we can do like a calculation so if the attendance is is less than uh 5000 we can say uh attendances uh, attendances uh divided by 2 for instance and then i, I would have to do it throughout everything because again because that would return a numeric and this is going to return a uh, text so that would not be good um but i could do uh various calculations in fact looking at that that's exactly what we want you to do so we want uh, uh we want to do another data and we want to do a, a new case statement so i would copy that one but we're going to be looking at our type. So where type is one, we want the, it to return half the number of attendances. Uh, if it's type two, then we just want to triple the attendances. And if it's type other, we want to times the attendances by four. I don't know why I say quads the attendances. And then have a, a default with a super suitable error message if if for whatever reason, we haven't got a type one, two, or other. 
So there is a nice little hint there for you uh, to make sure that your returns here are all of the same data type. Uh, there we go. So over to you. So the only options for type are one, two, and other. And again, if you wanted to remember how to, oops, if you wanted to remember what the options for your data frame were, data dollar sign uh, type, we could have a look and that will show us what our options are. So again, using some of the stuff we used earlier, uh, it'll tell us what our options are. Didn't see in the chat if anybody had any specific lunchtime commitments they needed to get off for. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep it fluid and we will keep going until we reach a sort of point at lunchtime-ish. If that's okay. If anybody has got anything, please shout. So we want that to be... Just show what we're saying that I need to do. So, tendencies divided by two. Tendencies three. So this was the trick in the question, which hopefully uh, sort of picked up earlier, in that you must have your default must be of the same data type as above. So where it's really nice to have error does not compute in my other uh, <laughs> in my, my other one because I was returning a string. Sometimes when you've got something like this, you need a different type of flag to show you that you've got uh, an issue. So let's have a look, and hopefully this one will run. Oh, what have I got? Oh, three ones. Okay. Ah. So I'm just going to call my new column attendance malt rather than uh, groupings because we come back to the groupings in a minute. Let's just see if that one works. There we go. So let's just get rid of that. And look at that. Oh, lovely. Okay, that's interesting. Hmm. Oh, no, that's right. So where I've got type one, it's half to my 25,000, which is I've returned there. I've got, I've got an NA there because I asked about with my attendances and turned that to an NA. Um, and then I've got my others, and that's times my attendances by four. So that's right. Um, I haven't got any where I haven't got a type one, two, or other. So let me just coerce one. So data dollar sign type uh, in position 
free. I'm going to change to, uh, let me do something stupid, monkey. No, it's not going to let me do that because it's a fat. Uh, oh, no, it's giving me a warning. That's fine. I often need a warning. And then if I run that, at my data. Okay, so that's interesting. So it has, and I will come on to this later. So I've got these types as factors. So uh, we will just, we'll, we'll talk about factors this afternoon, but for whatever reason though, however, it's just converted my factor into an NA. So I've got an NA in my, uh, oh, I've made that way too big to be useful, haven't I? Let's change it to that. Let's start shopping to scientific notation. There we go, that's better. Um, so now I've got my period, I've got my tendencies, breaches, and admissions, and I've got my attendance grouping, which has all gone weird because I did something earlier and I reran it, so don't worry about that. I've got a type where it is an NA and it's pulled through a default value of 99,999. And I would know to look for that specific number uh, as an error. Um, so you try to pick a number which is going to be not found um, specifically within the data set um, naturally um, and just try to find something. Nothing, nothing too huge, otherwise it's going to convert it into scientific notation like I did uh, earlier. So that one will work. So let me just get back to my basic data sets. And what we want is, where are we? I've lost it now. Ah. What I want is a data set where we have got attendance groupings, because I think we use them later, if I remember rightly. So if we got a basic data set, again, with our period and attendance groupings working correctly. So hopefully, I don't know why I didn't call it something else. I've done it on my base data. Hopefully you've got a data set that vaguely looks like that. If not, we can have a look over lunch and just make sure you've got that straight because I think we use that in a, in a bit this afternoon. And we'll get rid of that one. So uh, that's sort of the, the R uh, tidy way of doing it. There are also ways in base R to run if statements, and they're really, really good to trigger sort of to dish, um, processes. So um, if you want to do a whole bunch of things, um, you can create these like if statements and then tell it to do this. If it's this, then do these things. And like I said, this is base R stuff. So it's not looking at an if else. So let's see if I can explain this. So we're going to create a variable and we're going to call it A and we're going to say A is 10. Then we're going to run this. If A is if A equals 5, then uh, we are going to assign A to be 10. We're going to, going to print A is now 10. Then we're going to create a variable B, which we're going to assign the value of A to. And then we're going to print B has now been created and is now A. Blah. Okay, so let's just run that. And we know that at the moment, A is not uh, 5. So if we run this, nothing happens. We don't have a new value for B and nothing's been printed. All it's done is just run the code. So let's do, uh, let's do that and change A to be 5 and then run it and see what it does. Well, so now it's evaluated that A is 5, so it has run all this code. So now it's saying A is now 10. So if we look up here, we have now changed A the value of A to be 10. And then we've also said B has been created and is a variable and is now A. So we now got a new variable which we've created, and it's 10, which is what the value of A was. So, so super duper powerful if you're rating sort of more 
I don't know, complex programming type things to say, well, if it does this, do this bunch of stuff. And if it's this, do this bunch of stuff. So it's much more of a programmy thing rather than a, a data wrangly thing. Um, we can also add uh, an else into things. Um, so again, um, if A equals five, then do everything in these curly brackets. So basically say, if A equals five, do this stuff, stuff in curly brackets. Otherwise, do this stuff, which is in curly brackets. So let's have a look at what that does. So at the moment, we've got A is not uh, is not 10. So it's not five. So it should. Uh, I know it was telling us that B doesn't exist, but if B does exist. Um, B doesn't exist in that it hasn't been created yet, but we've, I created it earlier because I ran the earlier code. So, oh, that's interesting. While you're away, your project went to sleep. Oh, that's nice. I literally was here, dude. Oh, well. So, like I said, that if statement is is a uh, is a programmy outside of our uh, outside of like D player wrangly thing, um, and it does allow you to do really quite nice things. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Let's see. I might have to. Oh, yeah. Uh, what it can be really useful for is if you've got like processes where you want. I had it there literally yesterday. Somebody was working on some stuff, and they had a bunch of stuff which was percentages. And they had a bunch of stuff which was numeric and they wanted to do more or less the same thing over it. But obviously, if they were just doing stuff for the percentages, then they needed to they needed to calculate the denominator and numerators and create new percentages. Whereas if they'd already had the numbers, they just wanted to add them together. So it allows you to do more or less the same thing. But so if this is numeric, if this is doing that, then do this. If not, do this. So if we run this and if I just make a equals whoop, five, oh my goodness me, five, and then run this, it should do this whole A is now 10 malarkey and create B. Hope that makes sense. Not going to go massively deep into that because that's going to get us into massive amounts of programming stuff. But again, something to be aware of. And possibly if you see those if statements and it's not like an if else and it it's sitting outside of um, some, some deep player stuff, something to go back to and, and have a look at. But yeah, that if statement and that if and that else is really good. So just to say, so if, and you do brackets and you just set up a conditional. And then if it's this, do this. And it also means you can set up a one-sided conditional. So if A is five, do this. Otherwise, do nothing. Just, just ignore it and move on, uh, which again is really, really quite useful and powerful in that you don't have to create a, a, an else side. So anyway, there we go. So let's have a look at group and mutate and making subtotals. So we want to create a total number of attendances across all types by organization and group. So if we go back to our, our data, we want to know the total number of attendances for RF4 for this period and create a total number of attendances. And then we can also then use our total if we create a, where are we? No, oh, my goodness me. Uh, if we to create a total number of attendances, we can then divide our attendances by our total number of attendances, divide it by 100, and that will give us uh, our percentage. So we want to do all of that in as, as few steps as possible. So we're going to work out for this period, for this organization code, what percentage of attendances there were by each of the different types. So we are going to take our data frame. We're going to mutate. We're going to create a new column, which is our total attendances, which is going to be the sum of our attendances. Then we're going to create a percentage of our attendances, and that will be our attendances divided by our total attendances, which we've just made here, times 100. Um, and then we are going to make sure that we've grouped it by our organization code and period. So again, this shows that really powerful way of creating pipes in that 
even within our mutate statement, we are using this total attend, which we've literally built in the line beforehand, doesn't exist as, as present. So let's run that one. And oh my goodness me, I've got lots of stuff here. But if we look at our to data total uh, attendances, so we can see our two one two eight nine plus eight one three plus two eight five zero is two four nine five two, which is wow, fabulously exactly what our total attendances are. And then if we do our attendance, which is two one two eight nine divided by our two four nine five two is 0.85 blah 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 and then obviously i've times it by 100 as well to give us our total percentage so now we've got grouped we've got a grouped total and we've also made percentages for each of our types so yeah absolutely fabulous uh funky way of doing stuff so that's fantastic um so oh it's over to you so that created quite a, a funky percentage um, attendance. Can you round it to one decimal place to uh, make that a little bit more readable? So adding another function to that bit of code to make that uh, just round to one decimal place. Uh, as per the start of the course, Google is your friend. Or you could just perhaps search here and see if you can think of a function name that might round a number for you. I think the clue there was in the question. However, it's really, if once you found the function, it's going to be really nasty about where you put all your commas and brackets. That's, that's the big test. Finding the function isn't the test. The test is where do you put your commas and brackets? And how would you do it? I did have somebody say on this course, some of the feedback, this, this was the hardest question. <laughs> So I do apologize for that. I think one of the questions that later gets even more bonkers than that, but I think it's hardest because it's just the most horrible brackets and, and commas. So absolutely copy that. And we want to find a round function. Has anybody got it? Hands up if you've managed to do it. Okay, fastest finger then. Hands up when you've done it to win the prize. That Anita, woo! You have to email your me your address, and I will uh, I will uh, get your prize to you. Has anybody else managed to do it? It is horrible. It's horrible. Yeah, Nick, well done. Sorry, I'm I'm still struggling to get my attendance total to actually sum. So okay, it's not, it's oh, not right. coming through properly. There's some okay, sorry, so. should be able to just copy literally copy that and all. All yeah, I'm just to... looking at the original code, and um, okay. it's just not. I even tried to reload the data table from the top, and it's just not summing. So I don't know uh, what's missing from it. So I'm just gonna. What's it work. saying? What's the error message? I'm not getting error message. I'm just getting a lot of hundred percent attendances, for example. Okay. Um. I mean, yeah. there are there are some without a doubt where it is a hundred percent attendance. I think. It does do that. But what's the best way to check if the total attendance checks? Because I'm I'm trying to like do it by org code, and they're not uh sorted by org code, and I can't see 
So you can just click on the 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 when yeah. you put. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yeah. But they don't have the. They should have the same. I guess I need to filter maybe. So it does. It does come through. There are a lot which have only got others. But if you scroll down, or or if you, it should towards the end get to these when where you've got percentage attendance. So, so you didn't actually win the prize. So who did put that? I, no, was... I didn't put the, I didn't put the hand up at all. No, 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 no that's all right. Then. Was, uh... Who who did put their hand up? Was it Yerick? Is that right? Just kind of, I can't see names. I'm sorry. I, I did put my hand up. with Daniela. Did you have you got it? Did you? I think yeah. so. Yes. Excellent. That's well done. In that case, you send me your uh, uh, address, and I will send you the the, the prize for. And it, it and it is horrible. It is horrible. So. Hopefully, and I don't know why it isn't working. If you run that code, it will give you our percentages. And so there's an easy way to do it. And that is to do perk attend equals round perk attend common one. And I'm sure that's not, not the way you did it. I mean, it's a bit of a cheaty way to do it. And if, if, if we run that, it will. Oh, oh! I've just not updated it. There we go. Uh, so that is a, a bit of a cheap way of doing it. What we can also do. So that's that's that, that's a sort of a, a cheeky cheat way. I mean, it does mean that you're having to sort of run two calculations. I mean, for for this type of stuff, that's not going to be massively annoying, difficult, but. Obviously, if we're going to try to do it a little bit more cleverly, we can do put that into a round function. And then we want to do a comma one. Then we want to do a bracket. And then we want to do a comma. And I'm hoping that's right. Otherwise, I'm going to look really silly uh, again. All right. So let me just close that one down. And ta -da. so I think going back to this one makes much more sense. So we're taking our percentage attendances and we're putting it to this round function and we're just rounding it to one decimal point. So the round function on its own is quite straightforward. However, what we are doing is we are taking that is our bit that we are putting into our round function. So we're taking that and changing that into perk and, and then we are doing that and that will work does that make sense i mean it is it is horrible and i think that's where trying to get your brackets and commas right is 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 really challenging about where they all sit um yeah uh, and it does try to do as much help as possible around what your round function is but obviously we've got something within our round function so functions within functions can get quite tricky and obviously this is a function within a function uh within a function so yeah that's why our brackets and commas have, have, have gone messy did everybody get the right answer eventually has everybody got that managed to copy that and, and get it to work i'll pop it in the chat because i know that one really annoys people to try to get right if I can find the chat. Where's the chat? Chat's over here. Oh, people have put some stuff in the chat. Yeah, you know you had to put the round somewhere. Perk equal. Oh, so Adam, you've you've added some brackets, but it's done the job. Um, yep, yeah, that's perfect. Good, good, good. So yes, horrible, 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 horrible. But you know, good practice. So, uh. So but I'm not going to go massively into this one. This is a kind of a, a show off around how potentially we could do something really, 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 really clever. And I'm not going to explain it all. But let's say we wanted to do what we just did for this percentage attendances, but we wanted to do it for attendances, breaches, and admissions. And we wanted to do it all in one go in a really dynamic way. So we just wanted to run exactly the same, 
but across all of our things all at once. So this is where this monstrosity uh, comes across. Um, so where we are, we're going to take our data, uh, our data, we're going to mutate, and we're going to use a little bit of our select statement where we did. So an across basically is saying that we want to mutate across several rows at once. So instead of just doing one row, we're going to do it to multiple rows. So we need to tell it which um, which which rows we're going to do. We could just use a tidy selector. We could tell it that we want to do attendances, breaches, and whatever the other one was. Um, but no, we're going to be even cleverer than that, and we're going to use is numeric. And then we are going to feed our data in. So where it's numeric, we want to then take our our dot, which is our um, our placeholder for our column name, because I don't know what it is. I'm just going to say, take all the column names where we've got numeric data, and I want to take that column name, and then I want to divide it by the sum of the column name and times it by 100. And then I want to rename and this new column that I'm making, and I want to call it perk underscore whatever my column name was. And again, I want to group that by organization and code and period. Like I said, this is absolutely just showing off and stuff that you can come back to later to have a look at and go, right, I'm going to try to unpick that and make some sense of it. Uh, so now when I look at my data top dot perk, I have basically calculated my percentages for my uh, attendances, breaches and admissions all in one go. And I've got percentage of emissions, percentages of breaches, and percentages of admissions all in, in one go. So I've just taken everything where I've, I've got numerics and I've converted those into those percentages groups by organization code and, and period. Well, like I say, not going to explain that in, in great detail now, but do feel free to, to have a look at it. And like I say, that uses those tidy select functions. So if I wanted to do tidy, and I just wanted to create a, a mutate where contains is ES, that would do exactly the same, except it would only do it on my data frame where I've got the ESs, which is, I don't remember what that is, uh, attendances and breaches. So it hasn't done it on admissions because they didn't meet that criteria. You could also, so this is using all those same tidy select stuff that we did earlier. So you could feed it in a vector of specific columns or, or whatever and tell it, I want to do this across all of these columns. I want to do the same thing across these columns. And basically you just feed in this dot and that's just a, a placeholder for your column name that meets the, the criteria above. Let's say this might be too much for now. But do have a look at it. And if you want to do that same process across a whole bunch of stuff, across a load of your different rows, uh, oh, sorry, columns of data, really, really good. Uh, really, really fabulous. Um, so <laughs> hopefully that, like I said, not going to explain that massively, but but do have a look. Just have a quick look at row-wise operations. So row-wise operations are basically creating a group for each row. So say I wanted, uh, going back to my lovely raw data set, I wanted to know in a new column, what was the maximum out of the attendances, breaches and admissions for each row? So I don't think it makes a lot of difference in this one because I think, I think attendances wins every time. But say for whatever reason, I wanted to just bring back whichever was the maximum of each of those. But I want to do it for each row and I want to check across each row, which is the, the maximum. So that's basically just using a row wise operation. So I'm just using my data. I want to do it my row wise and I'm going to do the maximum of attendances, admissions and attendances. So this is just creating a, a group by um, by by that. So if I look at my data now, oh, it's a little bit slow. Uh, I don't know why that is being so slow. That's interesting. But basically, row wise has just created each row as its own separate group. And why have I not got new attendance? Uh, 
Have I done something weird? Maybe I was. Oh, let's get rid of. Ooh. Where have I got new attendance from? Sorry, this is uh, obviously that's just the attendances and admissions then. That's oh, and I need another bracket. Ah. So, so now I'm just creating a new column, which is the maximum of, of attendances and admissions. And if I look at my data, yeah, whichever one of these is the largest, it's going to bring those through. So this is not a great idea. If I did breaches and admissions, that would make more sense. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, that would make more sense. So breaches and admissions. There we go. So between these two, 5,000 is bigger. On this one, it's pick breaches because 22 is bigger than 20, et cetera. So it's done it row by row. And then I've added in a, a, a max column. I don't know what the original version was. I don't know why I did that. Anyway, so where are we at? We are at 12 and we are hitting pivots. OK, let's get pivots done and then we can have some lunch because pivots are hard and horrible and... and uh, if we can get this done, we can just coast this afternoon and do all the easy stuff. So let's say we have uh, some long data, which is pretty much what we've got at the moment, uh, which is what we generally want to use in, in, in our sort of tidy way when we're doing sort of analysis and, and wrangling. However, when we come to spit out data quite often, I find that people want wide data. So let's just come out uh, with an example here. So say we've got our organization code and our month and our attendances here, and that's our sort of our, our long data. What we want to do is convert that into wide data so that we've got one organization uh, code, but we've got a, a new column now, which is January, February, and March, and that sort of spread our data wide rather than long. Does that make sense? So do you get the difference between long data and our wide data? So we're going to convert some data that's in our long format, which we've currently got, and we're going to make it wide. Uh, so let's start with some data, and we're just going to create a little cut of the data. Oops, I say that. Um, and we're just going to create a really small little data frame, which we can kind of get our heads around. So my goodness me, I've got four tons of stuff stuff up here. So if we look at our data wide, what we have got is one organization code, we've got our period and we've got our attendances. And what we want to do is change that period into a column title and make our data go sideways instead of long. Uh, we'll do it the other way around in a minute. Um, because yeah, uh, so it's always much easier to work with long data than it is wide data. But anyway, so hopefully you get the idea. We've got we've got we've got long data. So let's do a pivot wider. So pivot wider. We want to take our names from. So basically, what what are we creating as new columns, and then what our values are we adding to those columns? So we're taking our names is our period. So that's our month. And the values that we want to put under our month is our attendances. So if we just run that one and have a look at it, and now if we look at our data wide, where's it gone? Now we've got one organization code and we've got each of the months separately in a wide data set. Does that make sense? We're all good. So now do exactly the same, but all breaches. So you will have to create a new data wide and uh, a new pivot. But have a quick go at that, just so you kind of like. So have a look at it when you've created your little mini data frame, and uh, and then just make sure that you've got it so it's long and then it goes wide. So I think you can literally change attendances to breaches. Oh, it's kind. But 
but don't that wasn't a trick question or anything that was a really nice easy one so literally just change the attendances the breaches and you should have something that looks a little bit like that one uh oh there we go well there was bonus points bonus points if you can make the process one pipe So to get our bonus points, we can take that and we can delete all of that and do that. Look at that magic. So pivot wider fits uh, within Codiverse and then we can sort of pipe that through as well. So we can run that. And when we look at our data wide, we've got it there. So you can do it within within our pipe so we don't have to have that as a as a separate process okay so da -da 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 -da. so let's do some more complex stuff so uh this time we're going to do a data wide um and we have what are we doing so we're not filtering out the type this time so if we look at our data wide We've got an organization code, we've got a period, we've got our attendances, but we've also got different types. Uh, so we've got like duplicates or not duplicates, we've got multiple uh, multiple entries per period. So we want to make this wider and we want to do more or less the same. So same bit of code, we're going to take our data, we still want our uh, names from our period and we want our values from attendances so let's have a look at what that does and we look at our data wide so now we've got an rf1 uh, sorry our, our we've got our org code we've got our data type and now we've got we've we've stretched out our wide data which is based on our period and our attendances so Everybody still up with what we're doing with our data set? Yeah. I'm really confused because pivoting is, is 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 hideous. So please do shout if you've got any any issues. So let's do an even more complex site say a uh, version. So this time I'm gonna have multiple sites and multiple types. So we're going to filter our data. We're going to filter our uh, data where my organization code is in these. I don't know if people, I'm assuming people are aware of in. Um, so I want to or I want to filter my data set and I want to filter it where the organization code is in this, this string. So I'm just picking these three. I've not filtered out my types. I'm going to have all types. I'm filtering my dates just to make it smaller. So let's just run that one and have a look at my data. So I've got my organization codes and I've got several different organization codes. I've got periods, I've got my attendances and I've got my type others. So let's have a look again and see what this will do to, to our data. Uh, let's close that one down and make that wide. So it's, again, I've got my organization codes, I've got my types, and it's spread out my uh, my 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 wide data just for my periods and my attendances. So that's all all looking good, um, and it's sort of made those as that. So let's look at uh, the breaches as well. So. Where I had this previously, I was just pulling through the attendances and I was using my attendances as my number, as it were, in this in this data frame. I want to now pull through my breaches as well, which means now I'm going to have two, two variables or two numbers per, per uh, period. So that's going to get a little bit more, more complicated. So let's pull that one through. And we look at my data wide. So now, very similar to what we had before, 
except now I've got attendances and I've got breaches. So I want to make this wider again across my periods, but I've got two different things. So that's all getting a little bit messy. So let's have a look. Let's just run exactly what we've been doing previously is our, uh, is our names from period, values from attendances. Uh, where are we? Data wide. That one there. And oh my goodness me, uh, we've we've Houston. We we have a problem. It's done something weird. Uh, it's obviously it's not widened out our breaches because we didn't tell it to. We only told it to do our attendances. And then we've got these weird kind of nulls where we've got breaches and we haven't got attendances and it's all done all manner of, of of nasty nasty things so let's not do that so basically we want to pivot wider across two things so simply we are going to feed in our values from and we're going to feed that a list and we're going to pivot across two things so let's have a look at what that's done and um, pivot wide so now it's gone and it's done something really clever for us so uh, it's, first of all, obviously, it's given us our attendances and by date, and it's and it's made those. And if we scroll over to the right here, it's also now made us new columns for our breaches for our dates. And as you can see, it's magically created new column names based on the combinations of those of those two things for us. So it's 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 done that automatically. There are ways that you can define how it creates those common names for you. Uh, sorry, for you. So you can you can make them like user defines that they follow a, a specific format or, or something like along those lines. But just as a default, I hopefully you can see that that's pretty pretty damn clever, Adam. Yeah, sorry, couldn't find mute. Uh, could you make it do like? Per, per row, so you, you keep single months, but then you'd have attendances and breaches on separate lines. So is that pivot, pivot yeah, yeah, you can spin it around the other way. So, so you want names from almost that way around, isn't it? I don't know. I'm just trying to think if, if that's what you mean. So you want it that way around? Uh, no. Okay. Why is it not happy there? You need to move one of your brackets down. I mean, that needs to be down here, doesn't it? Yeah, just needs extra bracket. If we were around that one, attendances doesn't exist. Oh, because I need to rerun that, don't I? So if we look at it, that way around it's gonna be pretty weird oh that's no, still not oh i know that's the names from attendances which is that so we want names from type uh i'm trying to work out what it is you were asking so we want values from the attendances and Reaches. I think I've lost the question now. Yeah, the thing is, type an old code. Is that what you're after? I'm not sure because I haven't got period in there now. So it's going to do. What's that going to do? that kind of what you're after so you've got attendances by each of the sites across the period now in that and then we've got attendances and then breaches yeah so sort of as imagining keeping the, the months across the top and then having a line each for or code type attendances or code type breaches they are going to have a play with pivot wider and i'm sure you'll get it around to the the way that you 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 want it but yeah i mean so yeah, hopefully that's uh, yeah. Claire, did you? 
Yeah, I'm just thinking how to apply this to, to something I'm working on at the moment. And is the filtering that you've done here for sort of convenience sake and demonstration purposes? Because I've got yeah, a massive, is. massive data set. With, no, no, no. It, it just, just so, so that you, you can You could do it for all of them, couldn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. that's good. So it could be it, as long as the data set as you, yeah, yeah. you've got. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, yeah. I've just done it for convenience so that you can see yeah. this is what it looks like small and this is what it yeah. looks like wide. Because if I did it across everything, it would, yeah. <laughs> yeah, would, that makes sense. Thanks a lot. But yeah, you can do it. You can do it across a, a, a massive data set if you so wished. Um, absolutely nothing stopping you from, from doing that. So, okay. So that's making long data wide is relatively easy where it gets really messy and much much more confusing and i'm not going to go down the rabbit hole is making wide data long so uh i need to get back to oh my goodness me what was the default here because i should have corrected uh have I got my version here yeah sorry let me just pop that back how it was so i have now got some where have i got i've got some wide data so some lovely person has given me data in this format and i need to convert it now because i actually want to do some analysis on it by dates etc and i want to convert it into into some uh, into some data that I can actually use. So let's make some simple <laughs> wide data. Uh, so let's just have a quick look at my data. Okay, so I'm going for a simple one. So somebody's given me some data and it's in this sort of format and this is quite, quite common. And I, I want to flip it the other way. So again, I want to create a new column called period which is going to be my column headings, which were my dates. And then I want to give it the values that were under those dates. So as you can imagine, this is much, much more difficult because obviously these are all, uh, you know, they're all called different things. So it's, it's, I can't just say dates because obviously it doesn't know that those are dates. Those are column headings, they're not dates. So it gets, gets really much, much more complicated around how to, how to describe these columns to say these are the ones that I want to pick. Um, so going to use a bit of our tidy select. And again, we could, we could, you know, we could spell out individually what they were. Um, but yeah, converting wide data to long data becomes much, much more tricky. So we're going to take our wide data and we want to do a pivot longer. And the columns that we want to pivot longer are anything that starts with a 20. So thankfully, all of these start with uh, a, a 20 in our in our column names, uh, which is which is useful. As I said, the, our column names at the moment are strings. Um, so we can do that. We want to change the name to period and we want the value to be attendance. And we can run that one through and we can look at our data long now. And now uh, we've got uh, an org code, we've got a period, and we've got attendances, which is fabulous. I would just double check and, yep, as expected, because we took that period from the, the column name, just be really, really mindful now that we look at the, the structure of our data that our period now this is a this is a string that's not a date object. So if we want to do anything funky and convert that into date, we'd have to convert that into into a, a, a date object in order to do datey things with it. So just be really, really mindful if you're sort of swapping things around and converting them to column headings, etc., that it does come through in the in the right format. Okie dokie. So as it says, not gonna lie. Pivoting wide data to long is much, much, much harder. So you please, 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 if you're a data engineer in any shape or form, please don't create wide data because it's really hard to work with. Um, and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole now because we'll be here forever. 
Um, but hopefully that will give you a few pointers. If you click and again go into sort of the help, the, the F1 for pivot longer, you can see that it has a whole bunch of things that you can do around sort of like what patterns to do, transforming the names, what to do with um, sort of null values and various different transformations you can do on your on your pivots. And yeah, pivoting is, like I say, hopefully just scratch the surface of it, give you an idea of what's possible. But unless we want to spend the rest of the day on pivots, let's not go there. Um, where are we? We're at 1230. That's probably a good time to, to take a break. Um, how long would you like for lunch? We can do half an hour. We can do 45 minutes. We can do an hour. Um, I'm, I'm happy, whatever. I'm happy to go with a general consensus. And is that all right? Or do you want to go on for longer? I just think we've just done pivots. It's probably a good time to uh, have a break. <laughs> Is anybody, should we go for 45 minutes? Is that reasonable? Anybody need a full hour? Does anybody want, I don't know, like I say, it's, it's your training day. It's up to you. I'm happy to go on forever. I mean, judging by my little icon here, we're just over halfway. Um, obviously, some of the stuff this afternoon is going to get a bit more trickier. 45 minutes, is that okay then? Should we go with that? Any objections? Say now or for ever hold your peace or whatever it is. All right, we'll come back at quarter past one and I'll see you then. Uh, in the meantime, if there's any questions or whatever, plop them in the chat and I'll uh, have a look. Oh, sorry. You have been putting stuff in the chat. 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, 45 minutes. All right, let's do 45 minutes then. All right, see you at quarter past one. Cheers, all. Excellent. Good grief. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much for all that. Uh, perfectly seamless and not a complete mess up at all. So I hope everybody is back. Um, so yeah, we're going to now cover sort of rolling functions. So classic use for this is something like any &E attendances, where we have quite a lot of just sort of local variation between sort of weekends and weekdays. And we want to create a sort of a rolling average and, and try to smooth our data out a little bit. Um, I'm not a great fan of rolling averages over sort of years and things like that, because I think it really strips away sort of seasonality and, and, and things like that. And there are much better ways of looking at trends than just doing sort of big, long rolling functions. But we're going to we're going to cover them and, and have a quick look at how we do them. So let's uh, we're going to use the library called Zoo, which does have some really nice functions for, for doing stuff with dates. Um, so we are going to need to install that. So the first thing we need to do is go to Tools, Install Packages, and load in the Zoo library, which uh, thankfully, again, is quite nice and quick. And uh, we'll just call in the Zoo. Call in the Zoo. So let's have a look at our data set. So we're going to take our data set. We're going to filter it down to just um, three of our providers. We're going to arrange it so that it's in organization codes all together, then the types, then the periods. And then what we want to do is create a, a rolling mean uh, based on our, so this is our, our role apply, based on our attendances. We're going to have a window of six, which means basically our, we're going to look at the last six months worth of attendances. We're going to Calculate the mean based on that. We're going to align it to the right, which basically, if you can imagine our nice wide data frame, we're going to look at the right hand side is going to be our result, and we're going to look at the previous six results, and we're going to we, we're going to we're going to calculate our mean on on the right hand side, as it were. And where we've got any any blanks, we're not going to fill those in. So we're going to start off with some uh, nulls at the start when we haven't got six months worth of data. And we're going to group that by organization code and type. So if we run our data role, and oh, that's interesting. Can't supply dot by where. Okay, let's reload in my data because I've probably got something, some weird hangover from something. So I'm just going to reload in my data frame and 
because I do lots of weird stuff on all my data sets when I do that. Quite often I've got hangover stuff. So where are we? Blah, 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 blah. And get down to Zoo. So let's run that one through. There we go. Um, so I think, just reading by my thing, I still had my row-wise function. So when I was using my row-wise earlier on my raw data, I didn't ungroup it. So it was still keeping it as a, a, as a grouped data frame. So I should have done an ungroup and that would have probably cleared it. Um, but anyway, let's have a look at my data role. Um, I've got a lot of stuff turning up here. So what we can see is the first five ish uh, entries have, have got nulls because we, we haven't got anything. And then we've got an average of the previous six. So this is the average of the previous six and a mean average. And then this one is the mean of the previous six. And then this one is the mean of the previous six, et cetera, et cetera. And it's done that for, for each of the periods by each of the org codes and by each type. So as we scroll down and we get to a different uh, organization, it's now started again. So it's looking within this organization, the first five are going to be blank, and then it's looking back over the previous six and it's calculated that that average, that, that mean again, and um, has done that. So again, that's a really nice, quick and easy way to do uh, a, a grouping by two different things and create that rolling average. Uh, I keep saying average, but it could be specific rolling mean. Because what we're going to do now is chuck it over to you to see if you can change a, a couple of things on it. So uh, see if you can change the window to three months. See if you can add an additional new column uh, with a rolling median, uh, which is going to look over the three months. And with that median, instead of calculating it looking at the previous three months, look at the month before and the month after. So it's going to be in the middle of, of that. Um, and also, if we've got any blanks, so if we've got any NA results for that, we want to fill that in with 9,999 again. So we've got a, a relatively simple way that we can pick out our uh, our, our null values or, our, or our, you know, our error values, as it were. So... I would definitely start with copying and pasting this code and then and then tweak it. <laughs> it should just be a couple of things that you need to tweak. And likewise, if we've called in the zoo library, if you want to just confirm, you can press F1 over the role apply and it will just give you the options here. If you're not sure about how to, uh, what, what things we want to do. So let's have a look at the answer to the question. So uh, change the window to three months. So hopefully that's a relatively simple one. Change the three to a six. We want it to count a median rather than a mean. So uh, we can do uh, a median quite easily by changing that to median. And then a line, which I was just trying to see if it did give you the options. I think that's probably the hardest bit is just to work out what is this option to have it in the middle. 
and here in the help here it does say what the sort of the options are here so the options to have it in the middle is center uh, so we want whoops we don't want to do that we want to do uh, center center and we also want to fill we want to give that a 9999 for whatever reason because we want to replace the blanks so now when we run our data roll and we have a look at it we should start with a 99999 and then at the end of our little function or our, our feature we should also hit a 999 which i'm just trying to find where that is yep so that's there so that's our group and our median should be the median of these three, which I can't see very easily, but yet yeah, that's in the middle of those. And this median here is the median of those three numbers. And this median is, you know, one lag and one in the future. So that's what that center value does. Obviously it looks one, one lag, one to the future. And obviously if you wanted to, you could make it so, I mean, generally you do it on a, on a, on a lag um but potentially you could do it so it's it's forward so you could do it left aligned less left so it's uh, looking at the, the the forward uh time period okay uh hint read your error messages i'm not sure where i put that but anyway that's that's interesting um any questions on rolling functions i mean they're quite straightforward and like i say zoo does it really really nicely um so Adding a row number, um, really, really useful when we're looking at things like calculating times between things. So if we've got a, I don't know, a, a bunch of appointments and we want to know, uh, we've got like a referral and appointment time scale, and we want to calculate the time between referral to appointment or referral to second appointment, etc. cetera, um, being able to sort of give things a, a sequence and a, a number is, is really quite useful. So uh, start with something really simple. Uh, we're just going to create our data frame. We're just going to pick three of our organizations. We're going to arrange it by the organization code to type in the period. And we're just going to add a very straightforward and simple um, row number to the whole uh, little uh, data frame that we've got. So we've got a data frame here. And as you can see, we've got a row number at and strangely, it is identical to that over on the left, uh, our index where we have just got a row number here now. So we've just given everything uh, a single row number. That's great, but say for instance, we, you know, this was our first appointment and this was our, our second appointment and we wanted to calculate the, the time between those, or we wanted to calculate the times between the, the first appointment and the, the third appointment, we would want to do that for each organization code say for instance or you know say this is our patient or, or, or whatever so we want to do that uh, a little bit more grouping by so we can do a row number per organization code so each of our organizations now is going to have its own um own set of row numbers so again we're taking this data we're arranging it but we're just simply within our mutate now we're going to group it by our organization code so when we run that one and we close that one and we open it up again, if I can remember which one it's called, data row. Now we've got our row number again, which looks well, exactly like it did. But when we get into our new organization, now that again has got its new row number for the organization. So we've done it for each organization. It's it's come up with a row number. It's only done it by uh, by organizations that's not taken type into account at all. It's just purely done it on on that uh, on on the organization code. Um, so what we have also got is some um, what have we got? Uh, we've want to do if we've got like a, a a matching period. So let's just have a look at this one. We've got uh this one we have got the same period um duplicated 
but we've 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 just organized our data by period and by org code and then we've just um uh just created a number uh based on that so what would be useful is to add uh, a dense rank into things so if we did a dense rank what that does and we've only done it this time based based on the whole period so all the april uh all the april uh periods are going to be one all the may periods are going to be two and then june will be three etc so it's kind of grouped them all together um so we've 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 so we've only done it by period so that's period one this is period two this is period three etc um we could also if we wanted to um we could put a, a minus in front of the variable to rank it backwards um but say we want what what we can't do is inverse a date so say we wanted to calculate this but do it in reverse order so we wanted to know that this was the latest and this was um yeah so we're into the rank but we wanted to do it in reverse order so we so you can't put a minus in front of the rank uh in front of the period in order to make it its inverse because that wouldn't work so um yeah i'm just trying to remember i think this was following on from somebody's specific question so i do apologize for this so what we're going to do is make a dense rank of the period, inverse it, and then make an absolute of it. My goodness me. Let me just check what that does. And maybe I need to read my own writing and uh, find out the, the, the use case for this. So my data row now calculates that my earliest thing is my latest row, and then it works through backwards. So it's just a bit of a nightmare way if, if if you've got something where you want to do something in reverse order and you very specifically want to do that and you want to do it on a date. If you were doing it purely by, um, so where we've got a, a, a date here and we've got a row number um, and we want to do that backwards and we didn't have the period we could just put a, a minus in there and that would uh, that would inverse it easily so um so say we want a row number per date but we want to jump where we've got ties so let's just have a look at that so this is probably let me just double check uh here row because so this is probably that more sort of sporting uh, type ranking because we've got six at point one we then jumped to seven and then we've got six at point seven so then we jumped to 13 so it's a bit like we've got joint first and then you go to third rather than say we've got joint first and then we've got second um so that's using a a min rank method um so yeah that's trying to remember what the equivalent in SQL is called, but I can't remember. Uh, anyway, so there's, there's another way of doing that. So we are going to now remove um, the year 2018 from our data set um, and then see whether that still works. So just going to do that as in a filter. So this is a bit of a, a, bit of a weird filter, and I'm going to use a, a, a between function. So I'm going to take my data, I'm going to filter it down to my organizations, which is fine. And then I'm going to use a between function, which allows me to uh, calculate between dates. You can also put numbers in there as well, and it, it works on numbers, which is, which is quite nice. But I want to say I want to uh, filter out my data where it's between um, 2018 and well, obviously start of 2018 and end of 2018. And I want to filter where it's not between there. So basically, it will remove that one rather than filtering to that one. Uh, hopefully, that makes sense. If I just run that and I look at my data row, we should see 2018 is nowhere to be seen. 
So yeah, we can see 20, 2007 and we see 2019, but we removed 2018 from the from the from the data set. Then we're going to arrange it and then going to give it a row number again based on that knot. So we do that and go back to our data row. We've now redone our column numbers. And even though data, uh, sorry, the data for 2018 is, is missing, it's still just going to continue row numbering things as, as it was. So it's not looking for any pattern for the name. It's just showing you there. So let's say the not in front of the period is, is really good. So if I remove the not and add it in the data row, hopefully you can, hopefully we'll see that that's going to return just 2018 and nothing else. But obviously in this one, we want to remove uh, a period in the middle. So, uh, oh, gone over to you. Oh, and we've got the answer there already for you, which is, uh, all right. <laughs> so, oh my goodness me. Uh, okay, that was, oh my goodness me. <gasps> what a question. And so good you've got the answer already. I obviously forgot to delete it. Um, so the question was, it was to uh, take the code and remove the financial year 2017. So uh, no doubt you would have looked at this and gone, brilliant, we could have done this between, but we could have just done something easier and just looked at the, the year 2018. I think I did the between function because sometimes we work in financial years and we want to remove a financial year, which becomes a little bit stickier and messier. So in this... Uh, I'm taking my data, I'm filtering it to my my, my whatever, uh, my, my orgs I'm looking at, and then I'm just filtering it down and removing the financial year. And I'm filtering it just to type ones. Um, then I was arranging it, and then I was mutating it and giving it a row number, and then I was only filtering it down to where the row number was less than four. So... My goodness me, I'm sure you would have coped with this, no problem. And then we look at our row number now, and we've created the row number. We've got one, two, three, one, two, one, three. So basically, we've just got the first three uh, within that period, um, and we've removed that uh, pesky, pesky year. Hopefully, that makes sense. So that's all very cool. Um, so next thing we're going to do is do some grouping by dates. So quite often, and obviously, we've done a lot of things where we've grouped by uh, an organization or whatever, but maybe we've got, um, you know, various different teams and we've got, uh, you know, a result by each of the teams and we want to know the total by the month of, of what's going on. So um, what we are going to do is try to calculate uh, a yearly total. Oh, my goodness me. So we've got in our data set, we've we've obviously been grouping by and we've got like periods here and we've we've got like totals for each month. But what we want to do is group by the entire year. Um, so let's just have a look at how we do that. So first of all, if we look at just the first bit of our data year and we're just going to pull the data we're going to pick one organization and then we're going to pick one type just for 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 ease of use as it were so if we look at our data year um i've now got a data frame where it's just one organization code and one data type but obviously as you can see i've got a range of dates what i want to do is to work out what is my 2016 total what is my 2017 total and what is my 2019 total and just calculate totals per year so I'm going to do that. So we could create a new, we could do a mutate and we could create a new column, which was based on the year um, and then do a group by that. Or if you want to, and I'm not sure whether this is the the, the right way of, of doing it or not, but we are going to, uh, we're going to uh, do it all in one go within our group by. So we're going to take our group by and we're going to create a new column for our group by, which is going to be our year total. And, and our year total is going to be a floor date. So a floor date basically takes a date and floors it um, either to the start of the month, the start of the day or start of the year. So if we do sys.date, uh, 
that will obviously give us today's date. If we do floor date uh, sys dot date, oops, can't spell date. And then we want to do, uh, what do we want to do? Month. That should floor it to the 1st of April. Yeah, fantastic. Or we could floor it to the 1st of the year, which will give us the 1st of January. Which, again, if you want to do groupings by months and, and things like that, and you've got, like, dodgy dates of, of stuff when things have come through, doing the floor date is is really easy. Much easier to floor a date and put it to the first of the month rather than sealing a date and putting it to the end of the month. Because obviously the end of the month can be variable. Sometimes it's the 28th, 9th, 30th, or 31st, um, depending on which planet you're on or what month you're talking about. Um, so flooring date is, is much easier. So anyway, we're going to group by our new year total, which will be a floor date of our period, and we're going to floor it by year. So in this, we're going to take this and we're going to put all our 2017 data uh, will be converted to the 1st of January 2017. Then we're just going to do a bog standard summarize and, and bring back um, our total attendances, our total breaches and our total admissions. So if we run that one and have a look at our data year, We've now got a year total, which is our flawed date. So that's the, the 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 date. We could make that prettier and get rid of the the O1s if we so wished to, to, to just make that a, a little bit tidier. I think we can just do, can we just do year? I'll just try to remember. Uh, no, year, so it's day. All right, yeah, excellent. So we could, uh, if we wanted to, and I do want to, so let's chuck that in. We could chuck that into a year function and add in more brackets and make it even more confusing and add that in. And then run that and then look at our data year. There we go, even prettier. So now we've got a specific year. We've got the total number of uh, admissions, the total number of admissions and our number of, of our median number of admissions so by just you know by doing that flooring has allowed us to group by years um i think you can you can floor to a quarter and you can also floor to a a, a month if you've got like individual day daily data you could floor that to a month and then calculate a monthly total etc uh calculating a financial year so this one's uh this one's a nightmare but it, it's it's great um so if you want to know what financial year a date is in is quite a, a, a challenge so we're going to take our date again we're going to uh, we're going to just filter down to one organization name and one uh one type and we're just going to create a new variable called finance year and we're going to use our lovely if else so we're going to take the month of our period, and if the month of our period is over four, is greater than or equal to four, which means it's April or higher, then we're going to take our year of our period and add one to it. So if you can imagine, if we're in April, we're on third of April now. So our month is greater than or equal to four. So we're going to take this year, which is twenty twenty four, and we're going to add one to it to make twenty twenty five. So the 3rd of April 24 is in financial year 2025. Likewise, if we were looking last week when we we're in March, the month of our period would not be um, greater than equal to four. So therefore, we would just be looking at the year of the period. So March would have been 2024 financial year. So doing this little sort of month calculation is a good way of just calculating what financial year things are in and we've got data finance there and there we go we can see that our march 2017 is in 2017 and then when we hop over to uh, that's 2018 let's try to find it in period and yeah, and then when we hop over into April 2017, 
we then jump into financial year 2018. Does that make sense? Because I think it's a lovely over to you now where you have to use that. So let's have a look. Uh, and, oh my goodness, mate, even I've written here, it's a ridiculous question. So create a data frame that contains a summary of sites RF4 and RQ3, returns the maximum of by of type one attendances across those sites by financial year. My goodness me. <laughs> and yeah, that is a ridiculous question. So we want to know for each financial year, for all those two type sites for type one attendances, what was the maximum number of attendances they had within that financial year? Blimey, what a question. As I said, we are just going to be butchering that data set to uh, come up with silly questions throughout the day. Do shout if you don't understand the question. As always, nick some code that I've done earlier. We done, not done. I must appreciate it's very difficult for me to know how much time things take. It's much better in the old school where I could stomp around the room and uh, see who's still typing, etc. So um, it is quite challenging. So do shout if uh, if you know I am zooming things too too fast. But I will I'll run for it now. So we want to take make a data year, which would be our data filter or code in what we got RF four and RF four in uh RQ3 and type equals one. So that's that bit. We then want to create a financial year. So I'm just going to copy that bit of code because why duplicate? And then with that, I want to Summarize max attendances equals max uh, attendances. And I want that dot i equals or code and Finance here. I think that's right. Since I'm a look, there we go. 
So, date of year, where's date of year? Cool. Everybody got something similar? I hope. Anybody? Can we just go back to the code again? Yep. So the first bit is just filtering out there. The mutate for the financial year I've nicked from the, the one above. And then it's just the ah. sum is max attendances by org code. And I'm obviously grouping it by this financial year, which I've created here within this mutate. Which I think, I don't know. I mean, that always used to blow me away when I was coming from SQL. That's like, you can't, can't use a variable you've just created. You must chuck it into a crazy subquery or do something. So uh, I think that's where it used to throw me. And obviously, we're grouping it now by two things because we want to summarize it by the um, org code and the financial year. If we took it, took out the org code, it would then just create a group by the financial year. So that's what we've got at the moment where it's got all code and financial year. But if we grouped it by just one, uh, let's just put that as a, a, a T, then we can look at them side by side. That would, where's it gone? Yeah, T. That would give us the total by the year full stop. So if we go here, we've got 2212 and 5732. And when we do that, it's picked up 212. Did you, is that right? We all good? Let's pop that back how it was. Right. So, uh, right, we're going to go on to something a little bit different now. We're going to be cutting up some strings and, and passing some numbers. So, um, this is probably a weird example, and it's not the best one, but um, it's it's just an example. So when we look at our data frame, our organization codes have numbers in them, uh, like RF4, we've got R1H. So they sometimes at their end, sometimes at the beginning, we've got different amount of numbers in each one, et cetera. So say, for instance, for whatever reason, we wanted to pull out just the number from the organization code. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a weird edge case. But I have had this where I've had, uh, I can't remember what it was now. It was like some survey results or something. And they just appended a bunch of data onto the number. It was like, instead of just having answer, you know, answer column and then five the actual data said answer five in one string uh which was an absolute nightmare and because sometimes it was answer five sometimes it was like answer 15 as a as a string so this pass number function basically uh runs through it comes through it gives you it does give me a horrible warning message um which looks really really scary that telling me that some of my um so my organizations don't have numbers in them, so it's not managed to pull anything through. So it's just giving me a warning. Uh, but if I look at my data org code numbers now, uh, I've got a new column, hopefully, if it decides to load up today, maybe. Uh, there we go. We've got an org code name number which has stripped the number out of my org code. So now I've got a four for my RF4, my AD913, it's pulled through my 913, my Y, et cetera. And even where I've got it in the middle, if I can find one where I've got it in the middle, because I know there are some. Um, I can't find one there. Anyway, even if it's in the middle of that string, it's gonna it's gonna rip it out from the middle of the the string, which is which is quite nice. It doesn't deal with the uh, leading zeros. If you've got leading zeros, um, doesn't deal with that, but not much does. There are ways of doing leading zeros in R if you really really need to, but we we can do that if we want. Um, 
going back to our sort of lovely filtering, we can do like a, a, a string, a, a string sub detect. So say we want to do some sort of wildcard filtering onto our organization codes and bring back any organization that's got an R in it or any uh, organization code that's got a P in it. So again, I think we've used this all previously. But if we run that and we look at our data filch, now all our organization codes have either got an R or a, a P in it. Um, just talking about the pass number, there is a, a separate library which has got pass dates in it, which is just phenomenal. So you can feed it virtually any format of date that you can possibly imagine and it will try to convert that into a date object for you so if somebody has written out in text the 2nd of july in the year of our lord 1832 it will read that and it will do its absolute best to plunk that together into a date format maybe not to that extreme but when you've got one of those lovely excel sheets where somebody's put in you know 500 different formats of date into a single column really good at just sort of passing them through and, and uh, converting them all into dates anyway we've got over to you so which organizations have a number of over 50 into them and can you return a data frame with just the organization codes over 50. um so what is that what is that that's pretty much as it says so we want to do a filter where we have got, um, yeah, uh, an organization code over with a number that is greater than 50. Just know why I've done that. Hmm. OK. So, start with this one that I had earlier, my, my past number. I'm going to change my mutate into a filter. And because I'm not, I don't actually want to add a column, I just want to pass the number. So, pass the number, a org code. And then is work out where my brackets are going. And I want anything that's over 50. So just rejigging a bit of code we did earlier. So previously we added that as a column. Now I'm just using that same pass number within my filter. There's no reason why you couldn't have had it. You, you could have done it. And you could have created a, a new column on it and then filtered it on that column. Uh, that would be absolutely fine. But I'm just being lazy by not adding in a, a new column and just doing a, I don't know if that's lazy. Um, that's not the word. Uh, efficient. That's what I'm being. I'm being efficient and not adding in a new column and just putting through those which have got a, a, an over 50. So now if we look at my arc, my organization codes, you can see it's all those ones with the big chunky numbers and not the R4 Ks, et cetera. So again, just using that pass, pass number within a filter. Okie dokie. So uh, sometimes we want to shorten strings. So my classic one is I, I work for, for NHS England. I use I, I have to uh, use a lot of data where I'm looking at ICB level data. I call it an ICB. Mostly in our data frames, they call it integrated care board. So we will have something like NHS Bristol, South Gloucestershire and somewhere integrated care board or 
even a really short one, it would be NHS Devon integrated care board. And everything's got this like integrated care board at the end of it, which means if you're trying to chuck it into tables or if you want it in a graph or whatever, it it becomes really, really hard to, to see. I mean, I've also had it in like when we worked in a trust and we have like, um, we would just have North community mental health team and, it's like, and then we'd have South community mental health team and it's just like, I don't need that in my graph or my table I would probably just need North or South or or something so I want to shorten it so uh, we're going to have a quick play with strings so we're going to come up with an example string here so as you can see it's this string is so long it's even crossed my line of doom it's it's that naughty so we've got a really long string here so if we look at our example my example is this is an example of a long sentence i like to shorten it as it's far too long so we can shorten it by several different ways we can shorten it by characters uh so we can take a substring of our example and start at one and end at 15 and this will give me this is an exam so it's literally just taken the first 15 characters and, and done that uh We've also got a really nice function called word, um, which I find much, much more useful. So what we can do is look at the start and end word. So we want to start at word one and end at word four and saying just so that R knows that the separator between our words is fixed and it's a space. Sometimes you might have dots in between words or other weird things going on uh, with, with text. But this is um, a much nicer way. So now we've got start at one and we've got end of four. And this now has got this as an example. So if we sh you know, literally did seven uh, and, and run that, that would do. This is an example of a long. And if we did start of three, for instance, I hope you can probably guess what that's going to do. An example of a long. So again, if you just want to manipulate words within a string, I had it recently where I had, what did I have? I had like treatment functions and um, service names and they were crazy long. I just wanted to create, I wanted to shorten them, but just down to the first five words of that treatment function was sufficient. Um, in fact, I did something even funky. I removed like some ands and stuff from it first and then brought it down to the first five words, et cetera. Uh, but we're going to do removing the names now. So let's have a look at this. So uh, classic one is uh, making hospital names <laughs> readable. So I've got my Boggins University Hospital NHS Trust, which is great. Everybody loves Boggins Hospital. But I want to change it to Boggins Hospital because that's just going to fit in my chart much nicer. Nicer, nicerly. I don't know. Uh, so there we go. We've got a long hospital name. So I am going to use the library TM because it's uh, quite a nice library. In fact, it's an amazing library if you want to go down the whole text analysis and text mining, uh, which is why I bring it up. There would probably be some uh, string replace things that we could do here, which work just as well. But I quite like the, the TM library. So we've not used this library before. So we're, again, we're going to do our install packages and install TM. This might take a little bit longer because, as I said, it's quite a, oh yeah, it's not too bad. Uh, this is quite a big library because it does contain lots of things around text mining and um, doing sort of clever textual analysis. But it's not too bad. So let's load. We've installed it. I hope you remember that. It's tools, install find tm and then we run library and what we we're going to do now is take our long hospital name and we're going to use the remove words function which is ron seal it's going to do what it says on the tin and we're going to take our string of long hospital name and we're going to remove university nhs and trust from our string so no matter where they are within the the, the string it's going to remove them so we've got a long hospital name, which is our Boggins, and then we're going to remove words and we're going to assign that to short hospital name. And now when we look at short hospital name, uh, okay, it's 
kind of close, but not quite right, in that it has removed those words, but it's literally removed those words and not the spaces around them. So as you can see, we've got uh, spaces, double space in between our boggins and hospital. And we've also got some trading black space where it's removed uh, NHS and trust and, and kept those. So uh, yeah, so this comes down to my favorite, one of my favorite sounding uh, uh, functions in the world, uh, which is called string squish. So this just awesome function so S string squish uh again does amazingly what it does on the tin it takes a string function that has got spaces in it removes any leading or trailing spaces and also uh, cuts down the, any sort of double spaces in the middle of words into one space um I remember trying to do that by hand in some crazy for loop, uh, trying to look for double spaces and then changing them to one and then iterating through. But string squish just does it, which is just amazing. Uh, so now when we run string squish on our thing, it re it's removed our trailing and it's changed our middle space into one. So brilliant, we're almost there. Um, but as you can see, and I'm sure it's been shouting at you all the way through, there's a little bit of a typo in our Boggins Hospital in that we've got this capital P in the middle of our hospital. So over to you. Can you find and use your amazing Google Foo um, features to find a str underscore function? So I'm giving you a massive little clue. Uh, to see if we can fix that. So two minutes of Googling. I suggest we, uh, we stick thumbs up in the chat so we can see when you're done. Wow, Megan, that was quick. Wow, awesome. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. So there's not, so you could do a string replace and just search for that big P and replace it with a little P, which is right. Don't get me wrong. Uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, you, it would work, and there's various different variations using a, a string replace. Um, but what we can do is string to title, uh, which converts it into a title uh, whoop, case. So if we do that one, and then we look at it, we now have Boggins Hospital. So did anybody come up with string to title? Is that what you used? Or did you find something else or, or a different method? Where are we? Jo Georgie, is that what you used or did you do a different version? Yeah, I used string to title. Okay, cool. So there are other ones. So you can do like string to lower, um, which obviously, as you could probably imagine, uh, does string to lower. There's a string to upper, uh, various different things that you can do. And obviously, once you've got it into one format, if we went back to string to title, even though that's all been lower now, it will capitalize each of the uh, each of the names within there. So that's really quite a nice way that you can you can mess about. There are lots of different things that you there are. I mean, there are some nice were well, crazy things that you can do where you can only capitalize the first 
word of a sentence so, so it looks for the full stops and capitalizes after that and you can get it to do all of those crazy 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 things if you want to so if you want to go down the whole text manipulation yeah we could do things like that so right intro into factors where are we at we're all right we're good for time so factors so we've talked about well we've seen factors previously very very uh, earlier in that when we've looked at our basic data set, we have seen that our period, oh, sorry, our org codes and our types are down as factors. So what a fact is basically saying is it's a it changes your data into like a categorical data and it gives it what's more important is that it gives it an order. So we could give our data a low, medium, and high. Uh, feature and then if we ordered it by our low medium and high r would just look at low medium and high and just alphabetically put the low ones uh first and then no but the high ones first because that's h for high and then the low and the medium but what we want to do is set up a categorical order for our data so we want to say that low it comes first and then above that comes medium and then above that comes high so we want a specific order for our data frame so we are going to go back to our attendance grouping which i can't remember god it's like years ago we did that where do we do our attendance groupings oh uh, here so this is the this is the right one isn't it so uh i'll pop it in the chat if i can find the chat where's the chat gone uh, I can't find the chat. Oh, the chat's over here. I'll pop it in the chat again. So if you just run that one over your data frame again, probably should have kept it here. And I should have done my little Z, Z, Z trick as well because I can't remember where we are. Uh, where are we? Here we are. Oh, what an idiot. I literally did have it here. Oh, okay. Let's. Oh, no, I didn't. So there we go. So going to take our data. We're going to run that on it so that we've got our attendance groupings. So we have should have a data frame that looks like this. So as we can see, we can click on our attendances and we can see that when we look at it here now, we've got our attendance grouping. If I scroll down, oh my goodness me, uh, further down, we can see because we've ordered it by attendances, our attendance grouping is in order. But if we now order it by the attendance grouping, it's simply going to put these in like alphabetical order. And obviously one is first, so it's going to put that first. Then it's going to go to, where are we going that? Then it's going to go to the 5,000s. Then it's going to go to the less than, etc. So it's not put our groupings aren't in order. It's just put those in alphabetical order. So let's have a look at our attendance groupings. Look, in fact, I've probably done something simpler there. So when I've looked at my data fact, there we go, that makes much more sense. I've done a shortened version. When I've done my attendance grouping, it's not in order by the attendances. It's just put these in alphabetical order. So we've got our 15, then we've got our 20, then we've got our 25. Then we've got our five and then we've got our less than. So our attendance groupings aren't actually in any categorical order. Even more annoyingly is if we wanted to chuck that into a plot and we're just going to do a very simple bar plot based on our attendance groupings. When we plot that, uh, as you can see, whoop, uh, where's that gone? Uh, our orders of our groups are not in order. It's put those in alphabetical order, which is not, again, not what we want. We want to be able to put those in a, you know, their correct hierarchical order. So we are going to change our data type. And if we look at our data type in our data set at the moment, in our data fact, we can see that our attendance grouping is, is merely a character. It hasn't got this factor uh, category. So we want to now give it a, 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 a factor. 
So we're going to change, we're going to do a mutate and we're going to change our attendance grouping into a factor based on the attendance grouping. And what's more important is that we're going to give it levels. So we need to give it the order of what order our levels of, of factors come in. So we want to do from lowest to highest. So we want to know what order our, our levels are coming into. So we run that one. And then we look at our data. We can see here now this has changed to six factors. But we look at our data. Not, by the looks of it, nothing has changed. In fact, let's just make sure I've opened up the new one. Uh, nothing has changed. It looks the same as it did previously. However, now if I click on my attendance grouping, it's now realized that those are an order. So it's done our less than, then it's done our 5,000. Then it's done our 5, 10 to 15, and our 15 to 20, et cetera. Why have I got an NA in there? Uh, well, that's weird. OK, we'll come back to that later. Why have I got an NA? Have I still got? Hmm. OK, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so now, when we do our plot again, based on our factors, and we have a look at that, we can see it's ordered now our factors in, it's order our graph based on our factors. Why have I got an N? So what have I got? Data fact is over 25,000. So that should come off as over 25,000. Did I not run that? Simon. Is it because yeah. the, the one of the twenty five thousand at the bottom of the factors is actually two hundred fifty thousand as an extra zero? Is that causing it an issue? No, that one, yeah, no. So that should be that, and that should be that. Because I can't spell. Let's just let's just. Let's clean that out again. So that's that. And then run that one. And then give it factors. No, that's still coming up. And the group. So let's just run it stage by stage. So have a look at those. Um, is it because it. sorry is it because you've got 25 plus in the first bit but then in the bottom bit you've got over 25,000 I have that's so how much up. It, correct there we go so yes your factors have to match your data set so let me change that to that so I had a space at the end of that as well so let me so if I run those and that one and now run that one, we are all, all we are good, I think. In order, I'm going to see it. And then we got our 25 plus. Yes. See? Making mistakes is learning. Thank you, everybody. And uh, there we go. And there's nothing better than uh, correcting your teacher. Uh, I would thoroughly recommend going and watching Tidy Tuesday, where you watch Hadley Wickham, who basically wrote Tidyverse, used Tidyverse against data sets. And there's nothing more satisfying than watching him do a single equals instead of a double equals on a, on a filter or something. And you're just going, ha! you do it too um so yes um there's nothing better so now hopefully everybody has got a uh, a nice sort of data frame there and we've actually put our things into uh, a nice order which is fantastic and then obviously if we wanted to filter or arrange by our attendance grouping it's now going to come through in the in the correct order which is awesome um so that's absolutely the the very, very, very basics of, of factors, um, just to kind of explain where they are. 
And I think we kind of used them a little bit earlier, but you can do some really, really nice things with them. So for instance, if you wanted to factor your uh, teams so that they always come through in a certain order, if you or if you've got like ICBs and you wanted to have a list of all the ICBs, but you wanted to put them in like regional order, you could you would have to do it horribly by hand, but you could kind of put them in a in a specific order, as it were, uh, which is which is really really cool. And there are some other really nice things you can do with factors, but just on that very basic sort of graphing and and stuff like that, that's that's really useful. And that's I haven't got time to go really deep into factors, but it's just kind of getting an awareness of them, and it's a, a lovely rabbit hole to jump down if you wanted to. Um, just going to say very, very quickly something very briefly about dynamic text. Um, I'll mention it more at the end, but we run a coffee and code session every two weeks where basically people who have either been on these courses or you just want to come and see what everybody else is up to. There's a bit of a sort of a show and tell. And there's also, um, you know, an opportunity to sort of open, ask questions. I did a session a couple of months ago, and it's on our futures page, and I'll, I'll share the link to that, where I did a whole, whole thing around how to make dynamic text for your data sets. So if you want to write some text that had like dynamic, you know, dynamically saying, you know, the latest value of this was such and such, and it's gone up or it's gone down or even better than that is, you know, you know, this is statistically changed and all those sort of things and actually write some quality analysis summaries to go with your your data. Um, it's it's a really good way of doing that. We're just going to do absolute basics here um, where we're just going to use a paste zero and we're just going to mix. So anybody who's done like sort of markdown before, this is just mixing a bit of text and then mixing a, 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 a number that which we're going to pull from somewhere else. So we've got our data and we've got here, we've got a data and we're just going to pull the maximum number of attendances. So if we just pull that, we pull through our 32,209. However, what we can do is do that in a paste that we can paste that into a string that contains that number. So now when we look at our text, our text now, our, our output for that is the maximum number of attendances was 32,209. Um, we can also use things like pretty num if we wanted to, and we could put a nice comma in our after our 32 and turn it into a pretty number. Um, again, probably not going to go massively into that now. Um, but again, you can mix and match and chuck in lots of different things. Like I said, I'm not going to go into this now because I think there's, I did a really, really full sort of like an hour tutorial on, on, on various different ways and a much nicer way rather than using paste, using a, a function called glue uh, around how to do text and, and mix it up. But as I said, you can see here that it's possible to say the maximum number of attendances was 30,000 and the lowest was one. Um, and I do a whole load of slicing. So we look at our data set, we say the maximum of attendances was such and such, and it happened on this date with this ICB up with this function or, or whatever. Anyway, so that's that's that. Um, so I'll point you at that and, I, and I'll make sure that you've got access to the, uh, the features page where that is available. So let's do a very, very quick uh, run through of plot the dots. I'm just going to scan through quickly what have we got. Uh, oh, we are nearly there. Fantastic. Uh, so plot the dots. So statistical process control graphs, which are an amazing thing. Hopefully you all understand what uh, an SPC chart is. If you don't, thoroughly recommend going and have a look at the uh, Making Data Account team do some fabulous training on how to read and how to use SPC charts. Um, I think a lot of the trusts and, and providers are using them. They're a fantastic quality improvement um, tool and a really good tool for us to stop thinking about, have we met target this month? Yes or no, that horrible binary. Yes, we've met target by 0.2 this month. So hooray. Oh no, we failed it by 0.5 this month. Do um, and actually looking at how can we identify is our process in control? Have we got an actual statistical trend in our data? So 
rather than, oh, look, it went up from last month. So look, everything must be improving. Can we identify a statistical trend? And can we identify where we've got unusual um, data sets? Um, I mean, the classic one would be, you know, say your walk to work takes you 10 minutes on average. Sometimes it takes you eight minutes. Sometimes it takes you 12 minutes. But on average, it's taking you 10 minutes. So you could plot that. You could see there's a standard amount of variation that you would expect to see. And then you would see suddenly if it took you 20 minutes, then you would say, well, that's outside of our normal bounds, what we would expect. Something's gone on that time. That's that's an unusual uh, that's an unusual measure. Likewise, if we saw that your average time was going up uh, as, as we're going on, so it was taking 12 minutes and then 12 minutes and then 14 minutes and 12 minutes, we could see that actually there seems to be a trend here from, from what we would be expecting. Uh, likewise, if we suddenly saw, you know, if we applied a target to that and said, well, you must be at work within five minutes, and yet, you know, your average is is taking you 10 and sometimes you're taking eight and sometimes you're taking 12. You're never going to hit that five minute target. So, you know, that's that's going to be, you know, we've got no assurance that you're hitting that target. Likewise, if our target was, say, eight minutes, we know that occasionally, yeah, you're hitting your target. You just happen to get lucky. But we've got no assurance that you are consistently hitting target. So anyway, that was SPC in, in, in two minutes. So we are going to use the wonderful NHSR plot the dots library. So we again need to install that. So this was based off of the NHS um, NHS improvement. Uh, where are we? NHSR plot the dots. Um, the methodology around sort of colors, etc. So it uses the same colors and the same methodology that the um, making data account people does, and it just creates us some really nice simple SPCs. So we're going to take some data that we want to chuck into an SPC, which is our data for an SPC. So we're just going to pick one organization and one type. So it's going to be a, a very small time series. Uh, based on our type one attendances. And at the very, very most simple thing we're going to do is feed it into a plot SPC function, plot the dots SPC. Our value field is our attendances and our date field is our period. So that's the absolute minimum. Oh, didn't call the library, silly me. Uh, so the absolute minimum viable product to spit out a not very pretty, um, but you know, hopefully you can appreciate within two lines of code or one line of code, uh, we've got a, uh, a an SPC chart. So this is our SPC chart. We've got our mean is calculated and there's our control limits so that we can see this is quite variable, but we are expecting things to be within these limits and we're not seeing anything outside those limits. So nothing special is happening. This is not a great example. So over to you. Um, so again, we want to have a look at the uh, the help function for the plot the dots SPC, um, and then see if you can add in a target value of seventeen thousand five hundred. And actually, we want to show improvement for this this uh, KPI that we've, we've we've created. Is that actually we want to be as low as possible? So we want to lower our numbers of. Um, attendances so the actual improvement direction is uh, a re reduction of the numbers of attendances so your friend is either the f1 button or a uh, question mark plot the dot or or search for it up here.
So definitely copy and paste what's been done earlier. Hopefully you've had a look at the plotting function and it tells you what additional arguments this function can take. And then there's a description of what those arguments are and there are some examples. Um, as I said, this, this library was created by the uh, NHSR community, which is you know absolutely amazing. It's out there, it's on CRAN, and obviously you can download it and use it, which is awesome. So let's have a look. So we wanted to add in a target. So that is simply adding in a target feature, and we want that target to be 17,500. 17, and we want to change the improvement direction. Improvement direction equals decrease. And there we go. So now we're seeing sort of something slightly different from what we had previously. We have now got a target line on our data set here, which is uh, our dotted lines. That's our target. We can see that this is our performance, and we are considerably below that. So even when we're at our highest, so our control limits are based on what we expect. 95% of our data is going to be between these control limits. So it would be very rare for something to go beyond that. So even when we're at our highest, we are still below our target. And that's our, that's a good thing. We want to be below our target. So we can see we are consistently performing well for this measure and we are currently just in common cause variation we're just within our normal expected limits so this is a perfect um uh, thing so you'll never ever see this in real life but this is what a uh, a system that's in control and consistently achieving target looks like um memorize that and just picture it forever because it's not, not going to happen in real life ever so uh oh let me get we got an i didn't i know that was me I oh, know there was already an answer there. I need to go through this and make sure I've deleted all the answers. It's very naughty. So uh, so now we are just going to add in some facet fields to our plots. So we want to create um, a plot for each of our attendance types. So I'm not going to filter out the attendance types this time. I'm just going to create a data set. Um, and if we look at our data, SPC... It's more or less the same. It's still down to one organization code, but I've got, uh, let's see where we are. I've got different types. I've got type one and two and other in there. So I've got three different types, um, but I am simply going to do the same thing again, but I'm just going to add in a facet field, which is going to be my type. So now when I run it, it's going to spit out and if i look up here it's now created me three charts next year they're not the prettiest and we will come back into that in a minute where i've got three different plots one here one here and one here send them all on the same uh set them all on the same axis it's not pretty uh but anyway we can see that we we have got three plots by using the um plot the dot thing so what we want to do is use our plot the dots um, sort of data, but we actually want to feed that into a GG plot and make it a little bit prettier because that's great. It's a good start, but it's a little bit clunky. So instead of just outputting it straight into uh, the output, we're gonna just going to, we're going to turn that into an actual sort of, it's a data frame. Actually, it's a list, but I'm not going to go there now. We're going to have a, a data frame. So now if we look at our plot S date our plot SPC, rather than coming out as a uh, a data frame uh, as a as a as an image, we've now got it as a data frame, which is basically all the underlying data. Um so it will tell us what our means is and our operand control limits. And it's got all the gubbins about where it's close to limits, what the point type is, etc. And this is all the gubbins which goes into the um, into the plot, and we'll feed that then into a plot the dots um, plot the dots create gg plot. So we're going to create a prettier 
uh, plot the dots out of here. So what we're going to do is change it so that they're not all on the same axis so that we can have a free flowing axis for each of these so that they're not each of them are going to be on their own scale we're going to change this date format so that it's just going to come out with month and year because they're all at the first so it's just going to come out with the month and year and rather than plotting each and every month it's going to plot every other month so if we run that one through and we have a zoom if that's starting to look a little bit more pretty uh, out of a, a couple of lines of code. So we can see on this one where we are, we can see on this one, and obviously we can see we've got something a little bit more uh, funky going on over here on, on this side. So over to you to add in a few more bits and pieces. So we want to create a faceted plot for type one attendances across these three sites. We want to change the point size. I think these points are a bit globby. Globby, is that a word? A bit too large for me, so I like a, a smaller point for there. Uh, we want to change the x-axis label so it says date rather than period. Uh, so where that says period. And then make any other changes that you think will be uh, nice to, to, to do the chart. And if you want to, you can think about using paste to make a, a dynamic title. I don't know. You can think about that from previous. It's probably not the best example for that. So let's just have two minutes uh, having a go at that one. And I don't think at this one, I haven't left you with the answer. So, uh, obviously, the first thing you need to do is right at the start is, is create your data set. And obviously, that's based on this first bit then run through your uh, standard uh, sort of SPC thing, turn that into an object, and then change the, the object that you're, sorry, the data frame that you've made for the SPC into uh, plot the dots, uh, GG plot here. And this will give you much of the options for, for making it pretty are going to be in this plot the dots, create GG plot. So again, if you want to do F1 on that or, or help, that will give you lots of answers. So I would copy most of this and and adjust it. And then I think we're almost at coffee break. Yeah, we are. I don't know whether it's because you guys are super clever or I have just been going way too fast that we are, are well within time. Uh, happy to go back to some bits and pieces if anybody got any questions at the end. Um, or whatever. Or just the general freeform one or anything. Yeah, I'll pass to you. Yeah, probably got another hour
So let me run through it. So the data is our organization codes and the three ones I picked out. And I also want the just the type ones. So that's the first bit. Um, then we want to do the plot SPC, values still attendances, still was still attendances we were looking at, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, attendances are here. Period are decreased. This time, however, our facet is based on the organization code and not the uh, type. So we need to change that over to org code. Um, then we did plot the dots, fix multiple. That was the same. Oh, I changed it to true just so that where possible, you should try to keep it true unless they are wildly different. So we can sort of, sort of see comparisons. Uh, I changed my point signs down to two, just because they weren't quite so globby. Changed my X axis label to date. And I did, and like I say, you don't have to do this. Um, I did a, a funky main title where I took my unique uh, my my unique uh my unique uh whatever they call org codes and then converted those into a string and then fed that into my my paste and uh sort of ran that here which then gave me uh, a far prettier chart with uh much much nicer dates i think the the dots are, are much prettier we've got the opera and the control notes we didn't have a target in in this uh particular instance and I've also got a dynamic title so that it's pulled through those uh, into a, a title. As I said, happy to share this at the end if you if you uh, want to sort of nick any of this stuff. Um, there will be, a, let's say, you've already got a, a version with answers in it. And I think I've stolen that from the one I did earlier. So um, there's lots of stuff with answers in there. So let's have a look at the time. It is quarter to the three o'clock. So we're going to take, uh, let's take a 10 minute break till five to three. Anybody got any questions on the SPC stuff? Apart from what is an SPC? No, otherwise let's come back at five two. We're going to do some very basic functional programming. What we've got, so we've got some functional programming. Uh, we've got some, we've got some simple loops, and then we then we're done. So that's all right. So actually, I'm going to be kind. Let's make it a 15 minute break, and we go till three o'clock. And that way, you can have a uh, cup of coffee and a bun if you so wish. Right. See you in two in 15 minutes. Where is that? But hey, let's pretend that I'm really terrible at uh, organizing my code and I wanted to put it into uh, some sort of table of contents. Is there a way we can do this? You know what? I think there is, yes. Oh. Um, so, so the table of contents is, is there down there at the bottom. Um, and to, to get something other than untitled there, because that's basically all your many, many hashes. Yep. But if you were to put words in the middle of the hashes, I think you need I think it's four after you need to have um four hashes a bit after your text. You can see you have some of them. But if you put after basic functions another four hashes, that will then create a subheading. Excellent. Now, uh, a heading. Now if you want a subheading underneath there, so it will create like a sublayer, you do two hashes in front and the same behind. I do believe is it I think just a hyphen will work as well at the end, but you need okay. like four symbols behind it, and that will create uh, like a two tier table of contents to actually navigate between topics. That would be absolutely fabulous. I think I need to go through and probably reformat format my code a little bit. And, it, it, uh, it's just because uh, you've been looking for yeah, things, yeah, yeah. So you can, I can have it by each topic you do, and that way you can just click there and go up and no, down again. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah, something I definitely need to do is make some tidier code to, to go through. So where are we? Uh, yeah, here we are. Cool. So thank you so much for that. Definitely, uh, definitely need to, to do that. And we'll probably come up with an example. So 
Uh, we've done a heck of a lot today, and I really appreciate that we have really, 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 really whizzed through at crazy, crazy breakneck speed. There is, uh, like I say, there is a version, if you go into the files, um, there is a version which is just called Intertrain, which isn't the student version, where I have put answers down uh, to, to the questions as well. So do feel free to go and have a look at those. Obviously, it's just my stock answer, which I came up with uh, however long ago that was. Um, things might have changed since then, so they might be a little bit old, some of them I need to go through and update some of my uh, defaults, etc. But it's, it's, it's there. Um, at the end of the session, I will show you how to download your version that you've made. So you've got your own your own local version. And hopefully, as I've commented this code to absolute bits, um, so hopefully you can go through and, and go back through it and, and find bits and pieces that you uh, you want. And also at the end, I'll give you some other pointers uh, around some other areas that you can find some additional help around sort of specific things. Like I say, within this course, we've I, I've not really gone into plotting much. We've just did some bit of SBC stuff, um, but we've not really gone into sort of plotting or tables or sort of markdown. There are some really good courses specifically around those things, which you can sort of uh, go. I mean, plotting, you can obviously go into the lots of pieces, lots of pieces around that. There's sort of Markdown and Quarto, and I know there's separate courses around that. And at the moment, I'm trying to design a, a course around tables and how to create some, some pretty and beautiful tables. Anyway, back to where we are now. And we're going to look at um, basic functional programming. So all the way, it sounds really scary, but it isn't. All the way through our, our journey that we've been doing stuff, we've been using other people's functions. So ggplot is somebody else's function. Mean is somebody else's function, etc. So all these things are functions, and basically they're just doing something in, in an order, a set of commands to come out with an answer. So basic functional program basically allows us if we want to do the same thing over and over again, but just change one or two variables of what we're feeding into our function, we can do that without having to copy and paste vast amounts of data, uh, vast amounts of code and just change one thing. So for instance, if we go back to our, our plot the dots and I don't know, literally, if we wanted to write a function that that did our, our plot here, but we wanted to do it for a different organization. We could literally copy and paste all this, sorry, this code here. We could copy that, paste it somewhere else, and then just change this. But as you can see, the only thing that has changed is this, nothing else has changed. It's still feeding, flowing through that same bit. So. What functional programming allows you to do is just create functions and you're just feeding a variable into that function and just slotting it into your existing process. Uh, hopefully that sort of makes sense. So let's just look at a really, really simple thing. So uh, we're going to have three variables. And what we want to do is times each of our variables by three. So we've got X, Y, and Z, which is 5, 10, and 15. So if we wanted to do X times 3, we can get the answer of 15. If we want to do Y times 3 is 30, et cetera, et cetera. But say we wanted, uh, oh my goodness me, then we wanted to know whether our output was odd or even. OK, so if we times it by something by three, we want to know whether our, our result is going to be odd or even. So um, we're going to use a very strange uh, operator called the modulus operator, uh, which returns the remainder of a division. So um, let me just explain what that means. So if you do four divided by two, it's two exactly with no remainder. So the modulus of that would be zero. If we did five divided by two, it will be two with one remainder. So the modulus of five divided by two would be one. It's that one remainder. 
Um, so it's a really simple way of checking whether something is odd or even. So if we do, um, so just 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 show you. So five, uh, so four modulus two would be zero. Five modulus two would be one because it's the one remainder. Um, so always, if we do anything modulus two, if it's a zero, it's going to be an even number, and if it's not a zero, then it's going to be an odd number. So that hopefully that kind of makes sense. Um, and it's also really really good if you want to. Yeah, no, not good. But yeah. Uh, so so what we could do is do it longhand. So. We want to take our x, which is our 5 here, times it by 3, and then take the result of our multiplication and then do a, a, a modulus on it. And then add in an if-else statement to show whether it was odd or even and return that. So that's our little sort of pipeline of, of process that we want to do. So we've got our x, and then we want to do that. And if we run all our little bits of data, we do our x molt is x times 3. So if we see that, we can see 15. We've done 15 modulus 2, which will give our x molt, which is 1. And then it's done a check whether that is a 0, and it's come out with an odd or even, which is great if we've got like our x equals, uh, sorry, x is 5. But say we want to change what our x is. So we could just change it here and then rerun. But we would have to rerun all that code again to come out with uh, an answer. And I'm assuming if we hopefully if we do a 6 and then we rerun all that code, that will come out as even. So that would be great. But if we wanted to feed in different things to, to that, we have to change it manually and we have to run all those bits of code over and over and over again. Whereas, you know, this, you know, all of this bit of code isn't changing. All we're changing is, is this. So what we want to do is chuck that into a function. So a function is basically a, <laughs> is a function. So function is a function, which is a bit of a weird thing. And it's a bit like that if statement, so that we feed in the function. So that is the function. And then we tell it what our inputs are going to be called. And these are just variable names. So we can have input. We could call it x. We could call it y. We could call it number, et cetera. But for this instance, we're just going to create a variable which is called input. And we're not going to specify what, what input is. It's just going to be changing every time. So we're going to create a function and we're going to assign it called is odd or even. So our is odd or even is a function that takes a single input. And then when we run our function, we're going to multiply our input by three. We're then going to do our modulus on our uh, multiplication by two. And then we're just going to return odd or even whether it is an odd or even number. So let's just run that. <laughs> and as you can see now, it's created us in our environment here, a function, and it's asking for an input. So what we can now do is odd or even x, and we can run it against our variable x, which is a six. So hopefully that should come out as even. Uh, we can do our variable y, and which is 10. So 10 times 3 should also come through as even. And we could also put in a completely new number that we've not even thought of. And that would also come through as even. Is everything, I think, that should come through as odd, shouldn't it? Yeah, there we go. So you can just put in, so basically, instead of having to type out and rerun all these bits of code now, we've now created a new function, which is called is odd or even. And it's doing all those things to whatever we feed into it. Does that sort of make sense? Um, maybe the modulus is a little bit confusing. Uh, do shout if it is. So uh, we can add 
several different uh, functions into a a, a variable into a, a feature. So where we've got our input, we could separate and we can have an extra thing in our in our function. So we're going over to you. So we want to tweak the above function. So instead of times by three, you specify the amount it multiplies it by. And then for bonus points, um, see if you can get it so it returns a string that says x divide, input divided by times by whatever is such and such and is a odd stroke even number. My goodness me, that was a bit bonkers. Um, don't worry about the bonus points if you were uh, if you're not there. Oh, and mine's gone to sleep. Don't go to sleep. So have a go at that. So yeah, if you want to add in another variable, you just need to put that in the brackets after the function and give it a new name. And then where it's got the times by three, call it your new variable, which you've just created. And then we can think about making it pretty in the output. So let's add. So definitely copy the first one. So, I don't know if you've been watching me or watching yourselves.
So again, this works a bit like when we were doing the if statement um, above. So this is a bit of base R where we're feeding in a function and then we're telling it to do everything within our curly brackets. Um, function can only return one thing. Um, and it also has a few other little Foy boys, which I will show you. So if we go back to our is odd or even, and we've got our function, now I'm going to feed in two inputs into my function this time, my original input number and my input multiplier. So I want to change my mult equals my input times my input multiplier. So that's um, so that's taking this second feature now. And then my mod is my multiplier with my modulus 2. And then my odd or even is exactly the same as it was before where I had my modulus of odd or even. I've written a very big, convoluted, horrible paste statement, which is, is nasty. That I've done return paste, and then I've got your input times input malt is the malt, and that is a and then odd or even number. So then when I run my little function over it, it now spits out five times three is 15, and that is an odd number. And then if I change that to two and, and then six. 2 times 6 is 12, and that is an even number. So if I had to do this across multiple things, uh, that you know, that would be that would be crazy. If for whatever reason, and you know, as as a, as, as it says here, we can also do um we can add we can create functions, but we can also then add that into our uh, into our uh dplyr -E type data frame. So here we go. We've got a hideous, crazy, crazy um, feature that we've made here. Um, is everybody with me with just building what, what we've done here? If you haven't done the return paste and you've just done the return odd or even, that's absolutely fine. Um, don't feel that you have to do the whole paste bit at the end. That's just extra, extra bonus points. If you've got that odd or even and included that second input, that was the, that was the bit we're after. So, um, so what we want to do now is we can take our function that we've built and we want to add it to our our data frame and we want to use it within our, our data frame. So let's have a look at uh, using uh, some data in our in our function. So going to create a new feature here, which is our attendances and our admissions. And then I want to apply um, attendance times times the number of uh, was it attendance times the admissions and return whether that's odd or even. Let me just change that to an odd. And then I will use my odd or even function, which I've created. I'm going to feed that into my mutate. I'm going to take my attendances and I'm going to times it by my admissions for each line. And, and run that through. So, as I said, completely and utterly ludicrous, um, but hopefully you can kind of get the idea. So now when we look at our data fun, uh, data fun, uh, I've now created a new column, which has got my attendances times my admissions, and then it tells you whether that's an odd or even number. Obviously, this is an absolute stupid example, but if you had something where you have your attendances and you want to add 10% and then minus something else and blah, 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 and create a really complicated something to do to apply to your data, you can create a function that kind of does it outside your data frame that does it on just one thing and then call that function into your into your uh, into your data sets. And likewise, if I wanted to do if I wanted to do my total attendances, I want to group it by my organization codes or, or whatever. It works just like any other function. So where we were using means and mins and all of those type of things, it's just a function now. We've we've just created it. So it can do all of the things. We can chuck it into group buys, etc. 
it's just a user defined function that we've created within our script. So it's just as powerful and as worthy, if not more so than any of those other things that we've we've just covered. So like I say, really silly example, but hopefully shows kind of the potential of what you can do with it. So it's not just about, you know, creating, you know, a, a, uh, a silly function that works on one tiny little thing you can then apply it across a data set um which is really 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 powerful so that's really cool um so it's not just like data functions that you can set up and have as an output so as we had previously we had uh we were creating a, a, a plot the dots and we were creating a nice little um uh table uh where sorry the table we were creating a nice little plot um but the only thing we were changing is our plot the dots uh is our is our site so let's just run this now and we've now got a new function called plot site and it's asking for a site and what this is going to do hopefully we can see we're going to take our data we're going to filter our organization code to whatever site we feed into our function and then we are going to do our plot the dots. We're still going to do a facet field across the uh, the types. And then we're just going to return uh, a plot. So now when we use our plot site, we do an RJ1. We get, uh, there we go. We've got a, uh, a site here. Let's just add in the title. Um, I can't remember what it is. What is it to add the title? The F1. Oh, yeah, main title. Main. Uh, main underscore title equals paste the array plot for site. And then we want to oops, put that in speech marks because it's a string plot for site and our, we want to put in our site. We want to copy that in there. So if we rerun our function and our site, there we go. What's that like? Blah, 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 blah. Multi-argument returns our, oh, because I've done a facet, it doesn't like it. Uh, okay, let's just remove that for now. Sorry, that's probably not a good example. Uh, yeah, we'll do that another time. Oh, come back to the plot. So that does a plot for that. And that will come back with a plot for that. Yeah, there we go. Because some of them are coming through as facets and some of them aren't. It's, um, it's not quite sure how to do the titles. I will see if I can come back to that in a minute and see if I can fix it. So, um, so now we can just pick anything out of our data frame. Um, so let's just try to remember. Let's just data dollar uh, org code and just pick one at random. Let's just pick that one. And where are we? We can feed that into our plot if we do that, and it will then plot that for for whatever we've got. So that's really, again, really, really quite nice that we've got we've got our plot, we've set it up how we like it, and we just want to replicate that over doing several different things. And we can just call that plot function now and we can change it. If we've got that plot function in several different places in our report and for whatever reason we want to change the point size, instead of having to go through and copy and paste it across each of our individual plots, because it's all in one function, we just need to change it in one place and that will just fill the free to, to everywhere else. Um, if we wanted to, um, we could um, points, is it point size equals uh, PS? And we could add in a new function uh, variable in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it as a default to two. So if I don't put anything in, it will default it to two. So if we run this, and now we can see it's done the smaller dots. However, if I wanted to, I could do a 
comma five and now it's going to give me big splodgy dots and if i wanted to i could have it as a one and run that and it should give me teeny tiny dots there we go um or as i said i could just leave it as as blank and because i've assigned a, a uh, up here i've assigned a default it will it will default likewise i could if i wanted to uh assign a default to my site so it's by default it's going to um it's going to plot my site there so if i wanted to i could remove that and the plot site and the default will be that it's going to plot uh, RJ1. But if I wanted to, I can put plot RY0, whatever that one is. And likewise, if I wanted to plot that one with a different size uh, dot, you can feed that in. So you can add those variables in wherever you like um, and, and tweak things, which again, hopefully you can see it's really, really powerful of how you do stuff. Likewise, when you go into the sort of help screen here, um, quite often on these sort of bits, what will happen is where there's a data or there's a field and there's not an equals to, that means you must fill in that data set. It needs it needs something in there. Where it's got a target equals or improvement directions equals increase, that means it's just set as a default as increase. So that is the default for the position uh, for for the chart. It will it will do an improvement as uh, as increase. So if you want to change it from the uh, default, you can uh, you can change it. Which means if I wanted to, I mean make it an increased chart i could change it there or i could just not bother with improvement direction whatsoever because it's got a a, a default set already okay does that sort of make sense um so where are we so we've done default here we've done a site so what this allows us to do um so just talk about some of the stuff that's in a function. So it's good practice not to call on something that's uh, outside of the function. So in this instance, we're calling the data. So when we're using this uh, data SPC, we're using this data which exists outside of our function. It's in our global environment. What's best thing to do is to call that data in so we know what it what it is. Um, whoops. So best practice is to spell it out and and to say that this is our site and our data is our data frame is our data, which also means if we wanted to feed it a different data frame, so it would then work on that too. Um, the other really important thing, and it's probably easier to explain with my ridiculous is odd or even uh, example here, uh, which... I've got them here. Yeah. So when we've run this, I've created a variable called malt, which gets fed into here. And then I've got a mod, which gets created. And then there's an id, is odd or even, or so odd or even variable, which gets fed into my output. These, however, do not exist in the global environment. So when I run this, they do not appear here. They do not exist. So if I literally do odd or even here not found doesn't exist it exists within the function and it will when i run the function it will work within the function but it doesn't exist in the global environment so if i start creating variables and things and doing stuff here it will feed into the final output and when i do my return it will it will spit those out but they don't exist independently and they're not built as you go along so yeah it takes a little bit of getting used to around what exists within the function and it's like a bit like vegas what what exists in the function stays in the function type stuff unless you tell it to return um which is a terrible vegas analogy okay so um so that's really good uh, da -da 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 -da. so yeah 
also means that by, by adding this data frame as a, as a separate thing, we can then point that at a different data frame if we so wish to. Um, but we have also set a default so that it's going to normally use our data, but if for whatever reason we've decided to feed in a different data set, then our function will still work, which is a really good idea because once you start going with some functions, you'll start having, hey, I used that function before and that was really, really useful. And if you make it as generic as possible, and you can then lift and shift it and use it elsewhere, which is, you know, absolutely what you want to be able to be able to do is go, well, I've got this function, it does this thing. Um, and then, you know, I've created a load of defaults for it, but I can then lift and shift that and, and use that. Or even better, find somebody else who's written the function and go nick theirs, which is, you know, just as good. sharing good practice. That's what it's all about. So there we go. So that will work just the same. We've set that data and we've pointed it out over there. So, uh, so what have we got? So we've created a nice facet plot for a single site. Uh, but now I want to create the same plot over a number of sites or even all the sites. Uh, what I could do is obviously call the function over each of the sites individually. So I could do RJ1, RJ2, blah, 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 blah. But uh, that sounds a lot of hard work. So what we want to do is iterate through a same process, but do it, create a loop where we're going to do the same thing, but over different, uh, over different variables or over different yeah, well, let's just do it and it'll make, make, make more sense. So let's just look at very, very simple, simply of what a, a, a loop is. So a loop is basically, as it says there, an element that repeats a portion of code the desired number of times, often with an iteration of values or variables. And it looks like I can't spell variables. Goodness me. So let's look at a simple sequence. So using the seek sec, um, command gives us a sequence between one to 10, which is fabulous. Um, I love the sequence. Sequence is a really underused, amazing piece of R where you can give it a start number and an end number. And I want a, I want a 10 digit sequence between those numbers and it will calculate like an evil even distance whatever so you can have like one and 25,000 like no 25,402 and then I say I want 10 bins equal bins between those two numbers and it will tell you what those numbers are which is fabulous um sorry I've gone off on a crazy tangent there uh but yeah look, but we're just going to use it in the most, it's most simplest format where we're just currently looking at uh, the numbers between one and ten so what we want to do, and again, our lovely um, uh, for function is a bit of base R, so it does use our curly brackets. And what we wanted to do is basically take our sequence of numbers and we want to add five to it and print that result and then go on to the next sequence. So we want to go one, one plus five equals six, two plus five equals or six, etc., and do it as an iterative thing. Obviously, there's much quicker and easier ways of adding plus five to everything, but we want to do it in a loop. So what we're going to say is four, and basically we say for i, i is, again, just a um, common uh, 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 way of doing things. We can call our i variable whatever we want. It's just, again, programming nerdy stuff that you start with i and then you move on to j and k, etc. It is just uh, convention, but you can call it whatever you want and we will come on to calling it some other things later. So we're going to say for i in sequence 1 to 10. So what this will do is basically it will run this piece of code and the first time it runs it, i will equal one because that's what we've given it is our loop then it's going to run through that piece of that sequence again and it's going to run through our code and then do the same thing for two and then it's going to run through it again and it's going to i this time will be three and then the fourth time i will be four etc etc so what it's going to do is take i and i is going to be every value between one and ten it's going to take i and add five to it and then just print the result which will be whatever i is 
plus five and then return the result i plus five and then run that so if we run our little loop we can say one plus five equals six two plus five equals seven etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can see it's iterated through that process but it's changed i to be uh to, to be whatever it is so if we wanted to we could do uh, i is equal sequence between 20 and 30 say and run that again and it will just run through those little same things again so 20 plus 5 is 25 i for the second one is going to be 21 etc which is which is quite nice uh, as i said we can mess up with sequence to come out with all sort of uh number patterns so we could do a sequence where it counts the where are we starts at number 50 and then it takes the number of rows within our data set and then calculates the sequence every 500 uh every steps of increments of every 500 between the number of rows of our data so we're going to start our sequence at 50 the number of rows in our data is 12 1765 but step through in increments of 500 don't know why we're doing that i think i'm just showing off the craziness of the sequence um thing we can also tell it the number of steps that we want between those things and it will then calculate the uh, numbers so that's very very basically using a, a sort of a sequence and we can just sort of iterate through i if we wanted to, we can just say i in and we can give it a vector of numbers. So we can run this code for 5, 12, and 27, for instance. And then when we run this, it will do 5 plus 5 is 12 plus that and 27 is. So we're just feeding it um, stuff. So we're just changing what our variable is that we're feeding into our little process uh, each time. What is cleverer is that we don't have to use numbers we can use uh we can use strings and characters so we're going to create a vector of bob mary and pete or bob pete and mary so if we look at our vector we have got uh bob pete and mary but and now we can we can cycle through that vector and bring through bob as our i for our first iteration and then for our next iteration, I will be Pete. And then for our final iteration, I will be Mary. Um, hopefully this is making sense, but please do shout if you're stuck and uh, I'm talking completely gibberish. I appreciate it is 20 to four and we've been going on all day. Um, we're nearly there, look, honestly, it's nearly, nearly there. So, uh, so what we can do now is look at I for our vector. And then all I'm gonna do is go hello and this return I. So we can span through our vector and we can say, hello, Bob, hello, Pete, hello, Mary. Fantastic. So instead of just using a sequence of numbers, we can make I uh, a variable. So that's cool. That's great. Um, uh, and that's, that's, that's great. Um, Got to be careful about how we, how we use things. Um, so we're going to look at how we can run our function, but within a loop. So say we've got our lovely SPC function that we've built earlier. We want to create all our SPC charts all in one go. And um, we want to pop them. We're going to have to do something that's called a list. And I'm not going to go massively into list, but we're going to create a list of all our, all our plots. And that because I just want to run through all that iteration and do it all in one go. And then I can just call which plot I want when from that list when I want to use it. So we're going to do something called a list object. Now, list objects are crazy, 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 crazy things. And it's probably way too advanced for where we're going now. And I appreciate we're an intermediate, but just to sort of cover, a list can contain a list of things. So it can contain variables. It can contain vectors. It can contain plot objects. It can contain data frames within a list. So imagine, oh my goodness me, this all gets crazy multidimensional. So when I say imagine in five dimensions, this is where it all gets tricky. So imagine you've got, uh, I don't know, over here, we've got all these data frames. We could fit those all into a single list and then pull out from a list the individual parts of each individual data frame. 
I really haven't explained that well, but basically a list is a big list of stuff. So uh, what we can't do is create a list from within our loop um, because as we create our list, we'd be creating a blank on every iteration. So what we're going to do is create a blank list outside our loop. And then when we create our loop, we're going to add to our empty list and, and add in there. So first thing we're going to do is create an object called plot list. And just it's just going to be an empty list. So when we look at plot list now, we've got a list of absolutely nothing. So we've got nothing in there. We're now going to create a vector of, oh my goodness, look at all this spelling. Why have you, oh my goodness me. Uh, we're going to create a vector of three of our different sites here. So we've got three of our sites. And then what we want to do is add into our plot list at position I. So lists have positions so that we know where to find it within the list. And we can name our uh, plot lists, or we can give them a number. So we can either say we want the second thing in the list, or we can also give it a, a, num uh, a name. And conveniently, when we're running through our little vector here, we're going to have RQM is going to be the name of our plot. And we are going to call that, our. we want to add our site into that list. And we're going to use our plot site um, function to create a plot. So when I run that, if I haven't messed about with my plot site, uh, oh, I probably have messed up with it here, haven't I? So let me just run that one and just double check I've got it working. Sorry, because I was messing about and doing things to it, wasn't I, with points and things. Okay, so that's working. Right, so go back to my vector, my my plot. So now when I run my little thing, there we go. We've got a few warnings, but that's okay. Now I've got a list. And if I look at my list here, I've got a list of three, which makes sense because I fed three things into my uh, into my list. And now if I want to pull something from my list, I can run that. And now I've got a plot list and it's pulling through the RQM. Now, if I want to do this, I could plot through and I would pull through that. So potentially, if I wanted to, I could make a vector of when we looked back at our org codes. And as we can see, we've got 274 different org codes. If I wanted to, I could run that. And that's my vector now of 274 org codes. Uh, run my plot list uh, cr across the whole lot. So it's going to create a plot per org list. This one's going to take a few more minutes or a, a little while to run through because it's cr going to be creating SPC and do all the calculations across each of those. It might even throw a little bit of a wobble, but we will see how that goes. There we go. And then we can just pick. Now we've got a plot for each of those. And we can just pick random ones here. And we have got a plot for each and every. I don't know what's coming with the training zero. We've got a list with a plot for each and every one of our 200 and whatever it was, 74. So we've made 274 SPC charts. It did take about 20 seconds to run through. So, you know, that's, that's not too too shabby really i mean it's not the most uh, efficient way of doing things but um it is a really really good way of if you want to do a load of iterations there and then if i want to pull those into different parts of a report you know that's that's absolutely what what i can do and i think well, wow according to this this is the end so we do have some time over more than happy to take any questions um, as I said, I'm happy. I'm, I'm working on some um, further courses. C course I'm working on at the moment is is making some pretty tables. There are lots and lots of resources out there around making pretty graphs, um, and there's also some uh, stuff around Quarto as as well. But I think I really want to concentrate today on just some of those data wrangling tasks because I think that's the you know, that is the bread and butter of the analysis stuff. Unfortunately, you know, we get onto the tables and the outputs and stuff, but wrangling that data to get it how we want it is, is 
unfortunately, 80% of the job, or maybe 90% of the job. So you're probably a bit of mind blown, but please, please do share it out. We have got a good half hour or so if needs be, or you can just go and rock in a corner backwards and forwards and go, ah. <laughs> I've got a question, Simon. It's, yep. it's about um, projects. So it's not really about data wrangling yep. as such. When would you use, if at all, a project? And, and how does that really sort of fit in with... Okay. With, so, yeah, I, yeah, that was my question, yeah. I would use projects all the time and I would never not use a project is okay. probably the simple answer. So what projects does is basically puts all your stuff in the same place. So it creates a folder for the piece of work that you are doing. Um, let me, okay, let me cheat and go over. I'm just going to load up my desktop bar because mm. that works with projects much better than um uh the, the cloud does and that reminds me do shout at me in a minute i'll show you how to download your your stuff so uh where have we got this is really confusing let's move that one out of the way so this is my desktop uh uh so where are we my goodness me uh have you got all this stuff on the top here it's just really uh can i move this out of the way oh yeah it does look at that magic <laughs> cool so this is my desktop R, and let me just create a new. So I've, at the moment, I've gone to whatever I was using previously, which is my community tracker data. And if I look here, I've got a I've I've got a link here to where my folder is. And if I click on my, ooh, there we go. Uh, if I look on my folders, literally, I can go in here. Uh, where are we? Uh, capacity tracker. And there we go. That's the same folder as whatever it is gone. Okay, go small that. Why is that weird? Uh, as my R, which is there. Oh my goodness me, sorry. Right, there we go. So if I put them sort of side by side, uh, you can still, not quite in the same order. Oh my goodness, it doesn't want to say that. Something weird. Is it? So that's created a folder and all my gubbins is in that folder, which is great. That's a great start. So now if I wanted to load in, uh, this isn't a good example, is it? Because uh, I haven't actually got any data frame. So, but I have got, if oh, I'm pointing with my finger. So here I have got, uh, uh, obviously, I've got a CSV file called DFW, which I've put into this folder, and we can see it here. So mm -hmm. say I wanted to load that in, rather than having to be explicit around the, 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 the pathway to it, because I've set up in a folder uh, and, and within a project, it knows that this is my default project. So if I did read, uh, oh my goodness me, uh, read, no, data is read dot CSV. Uh, what have we got? DF dot CSV. Uh, oh, I've got a bit of speech parts in there. No. Dear me, excuse me, just some loading timing this. DF.CSC. Where is that then? Anyway, that should. Oh. Ah. Sorry, this is me being stupid. Uh, NHS England issue, not a um, not a uh, uh, an R issue. So that should work if I was in the proper environment. Unfortunately, stupid old, stupid old NHS England. Mm -hmm. hey, I didn't say that out loud. Um, mm -hmm. It's got our default working directory set into the wrong place. 
that would work if I was in my UDAL environment and it would just read it from that that standardized place. It would also mean then if you opened up this project, you wouldn't have to change it. As you can see, my OneDrive here is all how we've, even though it's the shared drive, it's down to me as a user. So if I shared my project with you, you could still open it and you wouldn't have to hard code, re-hard code the, direct, the directory of where this is. You would just be able to plonk it in there and you'd be able to pull it out without any issues. Um, sorry, that's a very, very annoying uh, and interesting England issue with our desktop. So we have a virtual environment where I do most of my R, which is called our mm. UDEL data environment, and that works fine. Um, this was just my desktop version, which has got a few little uh, issues with it around where they've set it up. So that would work. And it just means that everything then is all self-contained and everything to do with that piece of work that I'm doing is in that folder. Otherwise, you start having really sprawly messes of stuff and everything's all over the place. And if you're trying to read a file from a different folder, then you have to be really implicit about the, the file path, et cetera, and it all gets really, really messy. Just using our project means you don't have to have that issue. Does that answer mm. the question? It, yeah, it does. Yeah, I think I just sort of missed when I first started learning how to use R, I sort of missed the whole bit about projects or didn't, yeah. it never really came up. So I sort of didn't really understand yeah, yeah, yeah. how they came into it. But that makes a lot of sense. Actually. The main yeah, thing is, is that it sets up a folder for you. Um, yeah. So it, so it sets up a folder for your piece of work. And then everything then is just, you know, that is your working directory for your mm. that piece of work. And then if you switch to another folder or another project, which is on a different folder, mm. it's pointing at that folder. And you don't then have to constantly change what you're pointing at. And also, you know, when you save your work, it's all going to save into that folder. It's not going to save somewhere else. And it just keeps everything all tight and in, in, in one place. It just mm. makes it a lot, a lot easier. Um, I do need to show you how to download your can code. I, before you move on, Simon, can I just mention for anybody uh, who is in an HSE who's not using the UDAL version, if yep. you go into session, and then set working directory, there's an option there to change the folder that you're working with to your project directory. So in, so where is it? Is it in just global environment? In session and then set working directory. All right, okay. And there was a two project directory. Yeah. So that should work now if I did that. Oh, look at that, as if by magic, it does. Uh, so I'm very, very used to desktop. So, so now I've set it, my work directory now is my project directory. So now I can just use that very simple read CSV without having to do that whole file path. So that's coming from that folder. If I was in a, so if I change my um, project and I go to, I don't know, my test mm. one, uh, let's not say that. And it will switch to the new project. It will then make my default folder, whatever is, is set up with this project. So, you know, anything I do there, which is back to here again, and it should, uh, do I have to do it on each session? I probably do in my two project directory. There we go. And then I've got all all my code, etc., is now set to my test, uh, my test stuff. So that's that's that. Um, I was going to show you what was I going to show you? How to download your code. So go back to here, and it is is it here? I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, there we go. So if you go down to this bit, make sure you've saved your work. It does do it as you go along. It's The cloud is pretty fabulous at that, to be honest. So you're, you've probably got your save grayed out because it's already being saved. Uh, but what you can do is go down to the more and we can do an export. And oh, sorry, we can pick which one we want to export, which is our intertrain student version and click on export. And then we can pretty much just download and that would download your version 
uh, there we go. And that's downloaded your version into your downloads. So now you can open that up wherever you wish. I'll just show you again. So just tick it here on inter, inter trained student version, go to more and then export. Uh, likewise, if we go to, where's it gone? My GitHub, which is somewhere. Where is my GitHub? Uh, Likewise, if you find me on GitHub, uh, Simon hash W slash M, there's an intermediate training. Uh, so the repo is here. As I said, this student version will be a complete blank version. Um, looks like I need to go through it and change it and change a few little typos here and there. And there's also this intertrain version, which has also got um, answers to some of the, the questions. Uh, if you like this repo and you like this training, feel free to give me a little star up here and say you like it. Um, do feel free to uh, generally search for me. And uh, let me see. I do have a bunch of repositories that I have created around various bits and pieces. Um, so yeah, do feel free. Some of them is my actual NHS England work and I've actually um, made some of this you know, code publicly available. So I've got some code here which works on community waiting lists and I've got like a quarto report that that spits out. So. If you click on there, you can see the full sort of quarto report and et cetera that it goes through and, and does. So do feel free to have a look at my code and laugh at it and go, oh my goodness, what's it doing here? Um, um, so yeah, even got some of those nice things that we did today where we like shortened our surface names. So literally what I was saying about today, this is the exact example where I came out where I was shortening my service names just to the first four words um, because these were my service names, which were nursing and therapy support for LTCs, leftomia, blah, 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 or even this one, which was just properly great, which is great, but doesn't fit on a, doesn't fit on a graph particularly well or on a table. Um, so do feel free to look at people's code and have a look at it. I'm a big fan of, of getting RAP and getting reproducible analytical pipelines. Where we've got code, there's absolutely nothing stopping us from, from sharing it. Um, long as you're not sharing your personal connection strings or sort of the actual overview of the of, of the database name, there's nothing else on there that's particular, you know, you're not sharing the actual data. So, you know, why can't we share the actual um you know the the gubbins of what we're doing with it, and you know people should be able to see that and and um, be able to, to take it and copy it and use it. You, it frustrates me that I'm in NHS England. We've got I'm in a regional team. We've got seven regions working on the same issues. So why are we creating it seven times? Even worse in ICB and provider land, where you're working on the same more or less the same data sets want to come up with more or less the same answers so why can't you write it in code and share it and have other people uh, you know other people use it i mean literally going back to my code here um i've written my report here in my example where i have where have i done so as i said i work within a region so i work within the southwest and i can run this report for the southwest it will do a comparison across the other regions and bring through my regional ICBs. If you worked in the Northeast team, you could change that region to Northeast and it would run that same analysis, but it would pick out your Northeast ICBs and run the same analysis and um, do that. You know, And that's a really nice way of working. I would also point you, if you're into sort of like the automated commentary bit, I've done a repo here. Um, where I've gone through, and again, this is all self-contained, so you can run through it and read through it and produces lots and lots of really, really nice sort of automated commentary. So if you want to pick out, you know, if, uh, just trying to look at it sort of towards the end, what is it saying? Um, uh, where are we? I don't know, put it there. 
so yeah you can start pulling through uh things with, like statistical significance and uh, just trying to remember or you want to say this this team is the second highest in the country and have that so that it's dynamic if you want to say um things like um i don't know uh so this one let's the final thing says the southwest has the highest number of referrals with the number of referrals the mean across the region is this referrals we and we can observe that this is statistically higher than such and such and then you can start actually putting in all those sort of significancy type things so it's looking at um things like the standard deviation and you know start actually starting to look at adding in some statistical commentary rather than just automating a uh, look at it this month it's up by four or down by two or you know that kind of nonsense so uh again there's, there's, there's stuff on that and then there's a there's a coffee and code where we've done that um let me see what else can i show out in the next 10 minutes i will send you a link with some of the um other bits and pieces which we've got if you go on to yes to this one there's an nhsr england r community but this does have uh various um demos in there i've also written a demo in here around quarto which uh, a lot of people steal a lot of things out of so this is a quarto demo and all the code to write it is here but this shows you how to write sort of standalone um, reports, et cetera, and how to do sort of various formatting of things, et cetera, how to change the size of things, how to do the sort of floating table of contents on, on bits and pieces, how to obviously do some charts, how to do some charts side by side with some data if you want to do some reports like that or uh, or charts with tables with, with columns, et cetera. Uh, how to make reports with little tab sets on I'm sure a lot of you have seen these sort of things before. How to make some reasonably pretty tables with some uh, bits and pieces and some tables with some little graphs and things in there. Uh, you can also make like interactive tables. So if we want tables which we can filter and do stuff to, uh, we, we can do that. Uh, we can make sort of interactive tables which have sort of hierarchies in them. So that you can sort of drill down and see sort of averages and totals by by hierarchies. Uh, we can make plots. Uh, if you've used Plotly before, you can make nice interactive plots uh, where we've got like hover overs and we can do things like zooming into particular areas. We can also sort of turn on and off traces if we so wish, and we can also uh, do things like. Uh, have it so that we're comparing across three. So we've got three hover overs at once. Uh, we can also do things where we uh, have sort of bo multiple box plots with sort of hover overs, which tell us our uh, maxes and means and our quartiles. Uh, if you really want to, you can make nice sort of animated graphs over time um, with a nice little slider that we can do that. That's probably not a great example. What I did do as a really good example was an animated um, population pyramid where I had genders and ages and showed that animated over time. So you could see how a population changed over time, uh, which was really, really cool. Uh, we can do things like make 3D graphs if you so wish. And these are sort of like also sort of funky and 3D and all uh, uh, uh what is it interactive so we can do things like that um i'm not gonna do yeah so all this code is absolutely available so if you want to write and uh, make a nice little like survey stuff you can nick my code here which shows you how to make a nice little survey graph um we've got like tree maps which is kind of like a pie chart alternative but these are sort of like interactive and you can sort of right click and uh have a play with those if you really really want those are quite nice um you can make sort of like dendrograms which is a, a sort of a, a pathway type um process uh type diagram which is quite nice if you want to see how those work where else have we got uh not going to go through massive heat maps 
Again, if you've got like Plotly, you can make interactive stuff with multiple drop downs so we can see what those look like. Uh, you can do sort of maps if you so wish. And these are sort of like click and draggable and sort of zoomable. And you can sort of turn off and on different layers if you so wish. Uh, there's some code here which allows you to make a word cloud um, and then some diagrams and various bits and pieces. So I'll send you the link of where that is and that code's all available. Uh, definitely a shout out to the Slack channel. If you're not on it, then please get on it. It's a fabulous resource where you can uh, ping people questions and get amazing answers really, really quickly. So um, I know I've got it on in the background and I'll get a little clicky thing and I'll go and have a look at it every now and again. There's quite a few people and we all fight for each other to to answer questions as, as nicely as we can. So do fill on there. No question is too simple. No question is too difficult. Well, questions are too difficult. Um, shout out to our Coffee and Code session. So that's every two weeks, we just have an hour drop in where we either have people doing show and tells around what they've been doing. Um, we have sort of like request slots where people say, oh, I want to know a little bit more about how to do this. Or if you've just got a really simple question, just plop it in the chat. And it's, you know, again, it's quite nice just to see what people are up to and, and what they're doing. And that's a real mix of uh, abilities. Um, big shout out, keep an eye out on the NHSR community website. That will tell you if there are sort of other sort of more specific training coming up. Um, and obviously there is sort of NHSR conference, et cetera. Um, cool. Is there anything else while you've got me? Questions about whatever. Do you find me on LinkedIn? Say hello. Everybody just stunned. I have, I have, a, I have a question. Is gen generic question about uh, the benefits and pros and cons of using the cloud versus desktop. Okay. Um. So basically, Speed, saving, yeah. losing your work, things like that. So basically, we use the R for cloud for for the training purposes mainly because. We're opening it up to everybody within the NHS. Some people are on NHS England, some people are providers, some people are using their own laptops. So everybody's using different technology and at different levels. I've had it before where somebody's turned up at one of these events. They've not had our studio installed. All, all their IT have done is just installed base R. So they couldn't actually do anything. So we we just use cloud just because it means everybody's on the same place and we're all using the same version of stuff and it just means we haven't got those it issues um so yeah that's the only reason to use the cloud other than that i would use your local computer within your local environment you shouldn't be putting nhs data into the cloud in in this way it's not safe for that um so yeah don't don't use the cloud version as as a as a standard thing unless you have got um you know safe data that is is shareable. Thank you. No worries. But yeah, it just means we're all using the same version, which you know it's it means I can show you on my screen where to click. Whereas if you've all got like five hundred different versions, it it gets messy. And then you'll even get the person who's turning up in VS Code, and it's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> no worries. Any other questions or comments? Was it too fast? Should I slow down? Cool. No worries. Um, do feel free to pop me any sort of feedback privately if 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 you're scared of saying I won't buy it, I promise. Uh, I will send out the invites to the coffee and code. The next session's tomorrow, I think. Oh my goodness me. Need to do some prep for that. Cool. Other than that then, I think we are we are there. So well done everybody for getting through it. I definitely need to go have a very thick milkshake and hopefully uh, rescue my throat and uh, catch you. So no problem. Thanks, then. Bye. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you.